Oh, Mike. Whiskey at 11 a.m.? <laughs> it's a few minutes early for you. Something wrong? Oh, hey, Connor. I just... I just looked in on the simulations of our downloaded selves. Living forever on a solid state hard drive. Never eating. Never sleeping. What could be better, amigo? It's just... Making some of our digital copies read that Ernest Klein stuff, it's, it's eating at me, man. It just ain't right. Hey, hey, lock eyes with me, Captain. There you go. It's not us suffering through that garbage, right? We're good. I, I guess. It's just our other cells are in real pain. Hey, they're just ones and zeros. Relax. Besides, a nearly infinite number of our digital selves are being tortured with hot metal pitchers or... Slowly dying of starvation. What do you care? I mean, Pappy is one thing. Dwight David Thrash, another. Stephanie Meyer, that didn't break them. But this, this just seems inhuman. It is inhuman, Mike. Our digital copies are not human. And the sooner you get used to that, the happier we'll be. Now let's see what a copy of The Mister does to clones 9,932 and 9,933. A ringing phone? What the... And now an avatar of a classic 80s desk phone appears before me? Hello, Digital Mike and Digital Connor. Would you like to read a book? What? Huh? Wait, what? What's going... Are you ready, player three? <laughs> Begin simulation! No! <laughs> no! comes to something of a surprise that we are in fact digital. Michael J. Nelson here. This is uh, 372 pages we'll never get back. I'm here with digital Connor Listoka. How are you, Connor? Hey, digital Mike. I'm quite, my O's and ones are doing well today. You know, I, I always sort of suspected that, you know. Did you? I, that yeah. we were in a simulation? Yeah. Well, well, the you were, I guess. There was. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that makes was, You know how I, was, I would always sort of like, it probably makes sense in retrospect, but I was always sort of spilling water on you to sort of. That was a test to see if your circuitry would lock up, you know? Oh, that's when then I would get the deja vu, and I should have, yes, of course, yeah. of course. Right. Now it all becomes so clear. It's kind of like uh, uh, re-watching um, the, the uh, I See Dead People movie. Right. Uh, yep. I should have seen it all along. Yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> well, we're stuck with it. Let's just do what we're, uh, we're required to do here. Ah, and uh, uh, explain, uh, explain what we're up to. We're, what we're required to do is, is, is read... You know, books that we, we sort of set out to, to read without the expectation that we're going to enjoy them. And we've, uh, we've covered a wide variety on the, on the podcast, but this one was bringing it back to where it all started with Ready Player Two by New York Times bestselling author, millionaire, hit movie producer, DeLorean owner, Ernest Cline. Uh, number one, as it turns out, uh, we now learn, uh, number one audio, audible book. A audio book, I yep. guess. Oh, uh, just yeah, millions of those sold. Millions and millions and millions. He can buy and sell us a, a million times over. Yeah. Um, and this is what he does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, know, I'm not going to bury the lead. This this is, I think this is the bottom of the list for me. I wow. Don't, I, yeah. Well, just based on we'll, how we'll it, get to it. Just based on how it wrapped up, like... There are things that happen where I just I have notes and one comes up right away. So maybe maybe we could just get started. <laughs> sure, why not? But yeah, okay. he it, it, we 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 I think in a, maybe even a bonus reel or fanfic, we got a little taste of the epilogue in this. So we knew yeah. that, we knew that some sort of some sort of uh, you know camel cased big idea was coming here um, with the big, yeah kind of a, a big uh, an Arthur C. Clarke uh, level uh, attempt here was <laughs> yeah, made. attempt is the key word but uh, <laughs> and so yeah it was like you know as, as we just kept uh, this last section was probably 50 pages of the book you just kept flipping the pages and I just started taking notes I'm like well 28 pages until evidently they're going to be <laughs> their <laughs> consciousness captured aboard a spaceship bound for Cent- uh, Proxima Centauri but uh Right now, he's still like you know running down the street in a spider coffin. So <laughs> that was almost unbelievable that that happened. That would have <laughs> fooled me with a real or fanfic for sure. <laughs> then I remembered I'm in a spider coffin. 
Yeah, it's so yeah. There's a lot of a lot of big ideas and also a lot of um, just just very sort of clumsy storytelling. But uh, I think we should just probably dive into it. Sure, we're uh, chapter twenty seven is where we left yeah. off. We, we get a nice meaty Kurt Vonnegut quote to bring us in. Yeah, that was just a you know that was a I drew the drew the cartoon of a hand with the middle finger extended there. Yeah, sure. It's <laughs> that seems like a a Vonnegut thing that he. You know, uh, got out of bed, did not shower, uh, <laughs> did not run a comb through his hair, and just started typing. And that's, or, or it was just like a, an interview where the interviewer had pissed him off or something. Right. This does not seem worthy of being put into a book. <laughs> yeah. Right. As any kind of quote. Or like for a while, that uh, the the popular uh, everybody you know wear more sunscreen speech was I, I believe you know misattributed to Kurt Vonnegut like one yeah, of the first right. cases of that that was it was like the you know gin and juice fish mp3 or like you know weird al you know misattributed napster files but it was of course in retrospect nothing that Kurt Vonnegut would say and it would have been nice if you know Klein had been duped by uh, another one of those or something for this epigraph yeah it's like the uh, those uh, circulated things you get from your aunt or whatever mm-hmm. They would often be attributed very strangely to Jay Leno. I don't know if you ever got one of those, where, where it would be some sort of like advice, like "Here's what you know how to raise a kid" or something. Says Jay Leno. Wow. When when did he say that? Right. And what relevance does that have to Un- anything? Undoubtedly, but Parade Magazine, probably. The sunscreen thing. It did turn out that was Baz Luhrmann. Right? Yeah. Um. I I I know he he made it into a song, so I, I assume he must have written it. Huh. That's odd. Yeah, an eccentric career. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, Kurt Vonnegut, and then we're right into... He's... Uh, he goes to... Now we're IRL, right? Well, we're in, yes. Well, not, no, he's, he can't go IRL because he's, he's locked in. He's, you know, he's locked into the... To the um, oh, right, right. Okay. Mega no, Oasis. And yeah, he's, that, he's, it comes up in a bit. All right. But I think, I think he has just pieced together the seven shards or has obtained the seven shards and now he's gone back to uh anorak's castle um to the room that contains the big red button and he's you know he's teasing us that he's about to take the oasis offline forever and he has the robes Uh, yeah we're we're reminded quite often that he does has retaken the robes in his sort of uh, crafty uh wallace shawnee and scheme by just taking them from the guy and the big tension is, if he's in this room, can Halliday see him? Because Halliday, being the most intelligent uh, AI that the universe has ever created, could be able to see him. So I hope he couldn't see me in here is kind of the thing. But then immediately, my assumption had been correct. Halliday had coded this room <laughs> of the castle so that only I, the winner of this contest, could enter it. <laughs> so tension immediately <laughs> dissipated. Well, yeah, and the tension was immediately dissipated if you if you had read the book because I, I was like, is this an assumption? Like, I think we were explicitly told that only the winner of the contest could enter this. And so I went back. It was on page four. To avoid okay. getting mobbed, I teleported inside the castle into Anorak study, a room in the highest tower that I alone could enter. No other avatars could enter this room. No one could have tampered with the egg. So, um, yeah, it's like you said, sixth sense. But if uh, in minute two, Bruce Willis was like, Wow, I got shot, but I don't feel dead. Right. (laughs) Uh, This is a good one. I heard the whoosh of Anorak's teleportation sound effect. And I just imagined. So he had to, like, program that in there, obviously, the Mm -hmm. whoosh. And uh, I wonder if he ever used, for, like, five minutes, he used uh, uh, Homer's dope (laughs) or uh, eat my shorts or something. (laughs) Yeah, just a tinny, uh, like, 12 12 megahertz... uh, audio audio file yeah where you can hear the the digital noise start up before it plays <laughs> just for a second <laughs> but um, no it's a nice whoosh so you know he's there yeah and that's a uh i wonder if he had employed like uh you know windows 95 had uh, paid like brian you know four million dollars to create that uh like mm-hmm. startup noise so maybe anorak had some some engineers doing that maybe they got uh brian Eno has a brother i think like who's got a very good brother name like Lester Eno or something like that. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then the action takes a um, very confusing turn just from a narrative standpoint, from a all this idiot has to do is tell us the story. <laughs> and he mm-hmm. chooses to do it in such a confusing way because we get a major role for telebots here. 
very confusing, very confusing about and it, where they are in relation and. So yeah, so yeah, we were confused earlier because so he is he's in the mega oasis through his um, spider coffin. Spider coffin. But then he's provided with I think Artemis slipped him some sort of uh, um, telebot control station. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this so we can so everyone yeah. can be on the same page. Instead of allowing me to use my real body to control an Oasis avatar, the Telebot control station allowed me to use my Oasis avatar to control a robotic body in the real world. So, yeah, he's, he's lying in his coffin. Then his avatar is using a fake virtual control station to then power, you know, a sort of uh, one of those... Um, Boston Dynamics, I think, is the lab that makes those crazy robots. Yeah, the the uh, terrifying dogs. You yes, know? yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, but so yeah, he says uh, spindly robotic arms extended from the rig to place a virtual Oasis visor and haptic suit on my avatar. These allowed me to see, feel, hear, and touch the real world from inside the Oasis, though through the sensory apparatus of the Telebot I was now piloting. So it's like the weird. There's always like guys who will you know hack. Some sort of system, like you take a mm-hmm. you know, Nintendo Switch, but then you get it to run Linux and yeah. then install DOS on there to play the original Doom type of thing. Sure. So that's sort of what he's doing from a narrative standpoint. Uh, but the the explanation of what a haptic suit is also, I, I, that's where I just wrote, this cannot, cannot be <laughs> happening. Where he's explaining that a haptic suit allows him to see and feel and touch <laughs> On page 337 of a book that could be subtitled, Haptic Suits Are Good. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Yeah, but that could be the dumbest storytelling thing. He's in the... That's where I sort of lost the whole thread of the story. So wait, he's still in the spider thing, but he's controlling things. But he needs a thing to control the things? Yeah, he needed the virtual... His suit suit to put on a suit to put on... why? <laughs> Why can't he just control them from his spider coffin? Uh, it's bullshit all the way down. I don't know. It's like it's just Matrushka of, of idiocy. <laughs> it's so but, bad. So like, yeah, so he does. He puts on a virtual Oasis visor to just go back into there. Um, and my question was like, so he's in the in the motive coffin. And is he just like, uh, you know, what what is he? Is he is he? comatose like he's he's motionless i'm guessing is there's like a thin stream of drool sort of running down one of the corners of his mouth as all this is happening yeah I, I, just like when he wrote this book i'm assuming <laughs> but, but yes yeah that's what's happening and then what is happening so anorak anorak is hovering outside like in a a, a cartoon or something yeah he's you doing know? the wily e. coyote before he looks down move essentially yeah <laughs> and so he's just like he's just like there bobbing up and down outside the window going, hey, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? <laughs> and and he's just taunting him like, you can't come in here? Uh, yeah, he's he's sort of doing the, you know, when, when you stop moving your video game character and, you know, Sonic taps his foot and looks at his watch type of thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> bobbing slightly, one of those action characters where they stop and then their arms just kind of move side to side. Yeah, yes. <laughs> when, you're, when you're picking your fighter in the, uh, in the fighting game menu. Right. Um, but yeah, so he, but the, also the important and very stupid part of the, this to remember is that where Wade is lying, you know, in, in his comatose state, he then goes into the Oasis to pilot a telebot that is, I believe he, we were, we were told is two miles from where the Wade's house is. Yeah. So that's even the, (laughs) you know, that, which of course pays off in a, in a moment that where this even gets even dumber, but it is a very sort of unforced error to be like um, interacting with the real world through these uh, like this proxy essentially even though it's um, <laughs> a stone's throw away from where you're lying in in comatose right so his yeah his brain stem is about to turn to jelly but he does have time to whip out a giant boom box <laughs> and slap in a Peter Wolf song to taunt a an avatar <laughs> who's hovering outside his window like Wiley e. Coyote at the time and plays the entire lights out uh uh-huh blast 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 yeah which which, anorak for some reason he didn't seem to find that funny (laughs) does he explicitly say that yes anorak didn't seem to find this funny 
and the way that it's presented, like I'm not familiar with that song, but just the the lyrics are written like you just writ light light blast ha 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 or something like that. There's no indication of the meter or the the tone he's saying it. So it's a very just as written. It's a very uh, needs some stage direction, I think, in the book. Yeah, if you don't know the song, it's uh, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, if you don't know the songs. Uh, we can dance if we want to. It's also terrible because that's the way that he signals to Artemis <laughs> that it's time to start, right? If yeah. We can dance if we want to, to which she replies, it's on like Red Dawn, mm. in all caps. Mm. Uh, again, he's about to die. <laughs> um, but they do, so um, they get there. Uh, his telebot is uh, in the same, I think, uh, mobile ambulance that Artemis and Miles are in Miles? I think oh, one Miles, of our top yeah, three characters. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> He's the Arnold lookalike. But so this, they're going to go try to rescue Og, um, who's being tortured by Nolan Sorrento. But <laughs> so it's Miles, and then the, the two like co-shareholders of the company, which to me just sound <laughs> piloting telebots, of course. But there have to be other guys like Miles is an ex Green Beret. He's got to have other like former Green Berets he could probably rely on to do this, but. Because otherwise it's like um, if like Sundar Pichai from Google was kidnapped and Larry and Sergi are like, we're going in. And uh, <laughs> they're like, no, we, have right. a, we really have a security for him that can handle right. this. <laughs> we, we should probably leave it to the uh, the team here. Right. So are they they are controlling – where are they controlling them from, though? Uh, so the those televots are – Sorry, Miles and Artemis are in the back of the ambulance, and Wade. I think there's like another like telebot wing of the ambulance, so that's their telebots unload, but they're staying back there. Oh, so Wade okay, is you so know, they're in his physically house. in an ambulance controlling the bots. Yes, and um, which seems you know unnecessary since these are telebots you can control from anywhere, and it you know doesn't doesn't go well because of this foolish decision. But yeah, they're they're sort of on site but remote. Okay, so they're driving the ambulance around, but they're on, uh, are they on haptic suits or are they on O and I's locked uh, in spider it, coffins? I think it's just haptics. I assume that's that's what you're doing because since he's using the virtual Oasis rig and visor to control them, that must be what they're doing in the back of their ambulance. Okay, so there's like four or five Oasis uh, haptic rigs, in the- rigs <laughs> with the uh, omnidirectional uh, treadmills. track pads, treadmills, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. He, he, he forgets to, like, set the scene of that. He just says the things. But that's what's physically what's happening. Yeah, they made a He's in a ambulance. spider coffin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but five people are in the back of an ambulance standing on tre- directional treadmills with <laughs> things on their faces. <laughs> right, okay. Right. Yeah, he's not good at, uh, not good at uh, spatial. And so once oh, you actually try to, to to suss that out, it, it it falls apart as soon as you tug a string. Yeah, action is terrible. But we do get this. I think this could be the ultimate eye lock. Oh yeah. Through all those layers of machinery and technology, we looked we locked eyes. <laughs> I saw determination in her eyes, but then her expression softened. And for a second I could swear I saw her looking at me the way she used to. My God. I could swear I saw her looking at me. Oh, it's just so bad. But even even through all the layers of machinery, we get a, an eye lock. Yeah, I mean, is there like a is there like a a cable news you know lag on the remote feed type of thing when they're locking eyes? Like, did one of them lock quickly and then the other one realized they were locking eyes a few seconds later because of all the you know uplink time and stuff? I mean, lag was not mentioned. That's true. They are they are near Columbus. <laughs> but it's not something he should assume because he talked about lag. That was pretty much the uh, banner thing from the first book, and now it's just not even an issue. Yeah, no, I guess you know. Well, that could have been a uh, one of Artemis's many sort of like social um, charity programs or something like that. Just eliminate lag worldwide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know how I was confused with the physicality. We do get it very much straightened out. Hey, Miles, I replied. Thanks for arranging all of this. Uh, what are you doing here i asked her i mean why are you physically here in the cab of this truck it isn't safe and then she says because og is physically here too and the emphasis is in the book not me yeah Uh, so 
<laughs> I don't know. Um, it, it seems like they've, they've missed the, the key feature of these suits is that they cannot be operated anywhere. But the, also, August physically here, she's, you know, again, she's shouting that into her haptic rig. So <laughs> it's, he's physically here, sort of. He doesn't need to be in any way. Uh, but she does immediately after that. He says, uh, "Og wouldn't want to put you in danger," and she she becomes a, uh, uh, a like a gum snapping uh, waitress. Like newsflash, sweetie, she replied. <laughs> <laughs> can we can we skip the uh, the brittle sarcasm and, <laughs> right. and maybe save the human race? I hope that the uh, what was the first thing he said? Thanks for arranging this. He said to Miles. Yeah, I hope that's what you know when when the SEAL Team Six was getting ready to uh, to go in and take out Bin Laden. I hope one of them said that to the other guy. <laughs> yeah, they were they were doing hand signals right outside Islamabad, but then once they're in there, hey, thanks for arranging all of this. Yeah, newsflash, sweetie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh boy. But, so they 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 take their telebots in. I think there's all sorts of shooting. They dispatch everything very quickly, uh, but then they find out. You know, they see Sorrento has a gun to Og's head, <laughs> who's like lying in sort of like a comatose state in a hospital bed. But there's also a Telebot in the room being controlled by Anorak inside the Oasis. <laughs> so he just oh continues to pile this this unforced um, mistakes on to make the scene as, as undramatic and stupid as possible. And then, so this is now the action begins. And once again, is this the worst way on earth to attempt to convey action? He says, quote, over the comm system, I heard Miles instruct four of the other Telebot operators to stand guard at the front entrance. Then he instructed the others to circle the house and try to find other ways inside. <laughs> Miles referred to this as securing the parameter. <laughs> <laughs> You're describing the action. You can describe it. Mm -hmm. what, he goes into the most passive language. Yeah. I heard Miles instruct four of the others. Yeah. Miles' this gruff is where voice crackled in my in my headset you know get around the parameter yeah. folks like you know you. there's no time to mess around right what what is he doing <laughs> i mean it's is the same it too thing. it's beyond his ability to describe an incredibly cliched action like move 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 go 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 bullshit he can't yeah. even do that yeah people doing the uh, point to your eyes and then point the two fingers forward uh, maneuver. yeah <laughs> right hold up your fist and then yeah right. come on uh, yeah, there's not even – at this point in time, too, I think the, uh, you know, the holding up the, uh, the boombox, Peter Wolf, and the Red Dawn line, uh, the, the references <laughs> really grind to a halt here for, like, pretty much the rest of the book. And it's a uh, – you know, you, you, really, you really see how much of the – to the extent they were doing any, how much heavy lifting they were doing <laughs> just by, like, right. you know, occasionally being like, oh, there's, you know, the donger from 16 candles or whatever. And that, that just ceases as he tries to make these uh, scenes sound more important. And it's like their absence is jarring. Right. You, you realize that, that window dressing pretty much was the, uh, <laughs> the, that was the whole thing. I right. mean, obviously it was, but it is hilarious when he attempts to, I'm going it alone, man. Right. I'm yeah, not exactly. going to use any references. This is just me. <laughs> yes. Unvarnished Klein. Immediately, uh, you know, has his shoes tied together, steps on a rake, and falls through a glass window is, like, essentially <laughs> the, <laughs> what he does when he stops relying on them. Uh, we do get a great uh, uh, description here. We were in Og's former home office and library, a large U-shaped room at the southern corner of the house. <laughs> I thought... One of Dickens' greatest mistakes was not to tell us which corner of the house Miss Havisham was located. <laughs> what, what, is, in, what could that possibly matter? It probably, you know, it's probably where Og did most of his, you know, indoor gardening. Like, you know, the southern facing window gets light the, uh, yeah, for the most duration of the day. Oh, I just love what he And then he starts, there's later, he, he'll put uh, things that are completely unimportant will be in parentheses. Uh -huh. there, there's just a few instances of that, like... It, he he loses the ability. He's like, I, I know I, I shouldn't put this in. It ruins the entire sentence. So I'll just put it in parentheses. <laughs> and if they're interested, they can look at it. But otherwise, they don't have to. Oh, my God. Imagine if imagine if this guy discovered footnotes. Imagine oh, how, how insufferable that would be. Oh, God. Um, well, we can, we can just hope that that doesn't happen. We can hope that his, uh, you know, whoever this editor is, she gets thanked at the end, but uh, she just has some sort of clause that's like, if you st if you start trying to pull this, I am walking, and you need me more than ever, man. 
Yeah, the, the uh, discovery of the editor at the end. Oh, boy. <laughs> or, the, if you don't think your name is going to get brought up later in this podcast, you are <laughs> sorely mistaken. Um, but so uh, we have Nolan Sorrento, and he's he's only briefly appeared. He's he's essentially popped up and been like, you know, smooth move, x lax. Like, he's, yes. he's, you know, he's, he's been in a life sentence. He was, I think was facing the death penalty, but then he gets out and quips essentially like that. <laughs> Look down, look up, look at my thumb. Gee, you're dumb. <laughs> right, yes. It's the, uh, you know, the, the bully from the camp across the lake, essentially, is the role of this guy who, you know, we are told repeatedly killed a bunch of people. Like, he's, you know, he's, he's supposed to be a big bad. But then he, he gives us some real, uh, you know, it, he's been painted in broad strokes, but he has, you know, it turns out some, some complex motivation, as he, as he reveals here. He has, we had an agreement, Anorak, Sorrento shouted. He pressed the gun harder against Og's temple and glared directly at me. I want my revenge. I want to destroy the Oasis forever. Okay. So I, I guess I was kidding about his, his motivations being complex and closely guarded. <laughs> he, he pretty much says it right there. Look, he's, I'm an open book. Why, why should I mess around? What are it's my very... motivations? I want my revenge. I want to destroy the Oasis. <laughs> It's just, uh, you know, not to be Ernest Kleine, but there's a line in one of the, uh, I think it must be the last Star Wars prequel where, where the uh, uh, Anakin just says, you know, he, oh, Obi-Wan says, you know, Anakin, the, the Emperor is evil. And Anakin goes, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, maybe guest written? Yeah, it could Ernest, be. Ernest Cline? Yeah, like, uh, you know, Bill Waterson was doing uh, Pearls Before Swine without anyone knowing from like, you know, and I think... Uh, was it was it Carson was writing jokes for Letterman towards the end, like just right, doing right. this anonymously? Lucas could be uh, he's probably bored. He's probably chipping in with his buddy. Right. Uh, but this is again, there's here's the way to write action. If you're uh, this is a little writing seminar. I rotated my Telebot's head <laughs> to scan the entire room until I located the source of the voice. That's how looking should be described. <laughs> yes. It had just come from around the corner at the opposite end of the room. To, off to our left, I could see a small amount of light down there as well. I walked my telebot in that direction until I was able to see around the corner. Are, are you? I'm, I'm tense. My pulse is racing. I can't wait to see whether or not he swivels his head to the left then and sees something. So the way they make that scene, you know, I rotated it until I found the source. Like you said, this is not how looking works. You know, you in, in, in real life, that would take, you know, point one seconds to like look and see something but it makes it sound like it's being like <laughs> right so source of noise located like turning back <laughs> forward <laughs> and it really uh, seems like you know if they do you know if if uh you know uh, paul ws anderson or whatever gets the rights to ready player two movie this should be one of those scenes where it's got like you know the sort of like Ocean's Eleven, they've got like different uh, frames of action. So they show, right, you know, yeah. they show his telebot, and then in the other frame, the bottom left, they have r virtual way wearing the rig, and then, you know, the the, the third, uh, right third of the screen, they've got him just lying comatose with the drool going down, like a little pulse pounding, like do 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 Right, and then, you know, when somebody, someone gets, t a bot gets taken out in, you know, the frame number six of the upper right corner, then you see the his face in a spider coffin, his eyes widen, shakes, <laughs> wipes the drool away, and, you know, the action begins. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, if you take it at face value, it's a, uh, if all that's there, that's, you know, we're, we're not imposing this. This is the way the story's being told. Uh, I'm going to call out that editor right now. Editor, you approve this sentence? Uh, we're in action now, so is this the way to write the discovery of something like this? I ask you, editor. <laughs> There was a hospital bed pushed up against the wall, comma, and Ogden Morrow was lying there on it, unconscious. <laughs> lying there on it? There was a hospital bed. <laughs> That's how you start. That's wow. A... That is the worst sentence <laughs> ever written. Lying there on it, too, has about, uh, you know, that's five words, but it, need, it has about three extra. Yes, I, I nominate this as the worst. I mean, I didn't put it as a dumb sentence because it's not terribly funny. It is just 
the worst way to describe anything that you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Your teacher would have it circled with in seven different places saying, no, no, passive, no, don't, unnecessary. <laughs> I mean, it's just awful in a thousand different ways. <laughs> Without even the, uh, the, the given that it is a guy through three layers of, of rig observing yes, that. Yes, exactly. uh, that's sort of, right. it's like, uh, you know, they, sometimes you have that contest of like, describe, you know, your, your favorite movie, you know, as badly as possible. And it's like, uh, you know, um, you know, farmer plows his corn to get ghosts to appear type of, you know, that sort of, garbage. Right. but that sounds <laughs> yes. like the, uh, the finale of 2001, you know, and it's all it's, you know, cinema scope glory, you know, there was a hospital bed and, uh, Dave, <laughs> uh, you know, was lying there on it. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, but then it, it, the action picks up a little um, as uh, uh, he says he's going to shoot Og, and um, I guess Anorak takes out Nolan Sorrento, like Anorak's mm-hmm. Telebot. Um, he, he does that, and this is unusual because this is not the way that, uh, that, that, that bullets usually fire. Um, they fire suddenly and without warning. <laughs> Anorak <laughs> fired a single round from his Telebot's forearm-mounted gun and shot Sorrento directly in the forehead. The impact rocked his whole body backward. It also must have caused the muscles in his trigger finger to constrict because the gun in his hand went off a split second later, firing a wild shot that struck Ogden right in the stomach. I just, I like his, his, his sleuthing that. (laughs) It must have because it was happening. Yes, exactly. He, it's bizarre. He's got a talent. He writes everything backwards or in a way that. You know, there's no way that it can convey tension. He he almost has a talent for it. Like he doesn't even accidentally represent action the way that it is perceived by human minds. Right. Yes. He always finds a way to obfuscate even the simplest actions. <laughs> right. I do easy. like that the uh, you know you're never supposed to write. I mean, suddenly because something mm-hmm. happens, it happens as suddenly as it happens. So yes. that's. But uh, that he couldn't. He panicked and then added without warning to. <laughs> <laughs> Two things you should never <laughs> suddenly end without warning. <laughs> That's so bad. That is the uh, that is the second line of of Snoopy's novel, right? It was a dark and stormy night, and then suddenly, suddenly a shot rang and... out. <laughs> yes. It's been a, that was a, a cliche for fifty years. Whew, um, we're we're in the thick of it now. Oh yeah, but then so then we get that that's the other thing too is that so yeah he has he has a talent for doing that sort of being his own unreliable nar- narrator without intentionally doing it. But then he has this this talent too that I, I sort of tip my hat to 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 coming up with scenes that are very funny that are a hundred percent not supposed to be. And yes, this one, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> this this is this is objectively hilarious, and it's yet to me like he's just seen you know one of the only people in his life has again just been shot and the reaction is inside my inside my drone control rig i reflexively bent over and began to retch repeatedly when i realized that my telebot was still mirroring my <laughs> movements i forced myself to get back on my feet so i mean this is again this is you know something that like if homer simpson got access to one of these you know he'd he'd be barfing and you'd you'd cut you know, or you know austin powers like uh <laughs> the, the 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 telebot is barfing on the floor like pounding it yes. you know you maniacs and then he sort of like realizes that's happening and gets up and sort of adjusts his collar you know towels off his brow like well sorry about that i <laughs> looks like your telebot's having a little bit of problem there homer <laughs> that's right or the telebots you know like you know pulling down its zipper and like got one one palm on the wall of the urinal to like you know take a, a long whiz <laughs> type of thing <laughs> you know you're uh, controlling a telebot there, Homer. Don't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I, that that amused me to no end. But it is it is played completely straight. Um, but even though the retching was taking place in <laughs> in the fake world too, so I don't but know, also virtual I didn't... vomit. Like, can you? Is there a is there a plug in for that to be able to pee? Oh in yeah, the, in that's the... a good. <laughs> Yeah, and it's three layers, so each one has to have the ability. So, yeah. But he also, how is he? I thought he was sort of held in place in his spider coffin, but he's able to bend over the spider coffin. 
Uh, no, no, no. He's referring to, uh, he says, inside my drone control rig. Oh, That's his the drone control inside rig. The so he's rig. thinking about bending over, and then his other rig, okay, so the second layer. His is avatar over is retching. And is retching. Okay. Tell him about his retching. <laughs> okay. I forgot which rig was, yeah, was doing the retch controlling. <laughs> that is no fault of your own. It is uh, <laughs> our dear narrator. Uh, this is a, uh, he made this up. This is when, again, when Klein tries to get creative. So then all of the, uh, dormant bots that they saw, they wake up now. Uh, then we heard the sound of breaking glass followed by the approaching rumble of hundreds of rubber grip encased metal feet. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> don't do, no, no, no. Ernest, please don't try to make up. And it's hyf it's hyphenated, so it's one word. Rubber grip encased. Wow. I didn't even notice that, but that is, again, a, a dereliction of duty by an adult in the room. Yeah. Uh, you're not Edgar Allan Poe. You don't get to make up words. <laughs> Tin but, tenabulation. Uh, no. Uh, again, why, though? Like, you know, we, we all know what those... Uh, what those drone guys in the in the Star Wars prequels sounded like when they walk, and that's all you need to do. Like, are they are they doing that to for for sound damping purposes? Remember, he's not making references to John Hughes movies or Prince, yeah, so he's I, on his own. I am. He's uh he's he's had a uh, it's like the guy uh, Princess Bride. He's he's now <laughs> fighting with his uh, uh, non dominant hand. That's right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they, I think they, they, they fight people off, but then they carry Og back out to the ambulance where Miles and, uh, Artemis are operating their telebots from. And then we get a, you know, we, we make fun of him a lot, but we finally get a, a moment to see like why he was included in this mission. Um, it says, I continued to provide cover for them until my telebot was overwhelmed a few seconds later when Sorrento's drones converged on it. I let out a fierce battle cry intent on going down fighting. And I was just like, all right, you know, I'd, I'd like to see Wade really sort of uh, earning his keep here. But they tore my telebot to pieces in a matter of seconds. <laughs> I suck. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> he lets out the war whoop and then just it's literally seconds. <laughs> he's torn apart. Yeah, he's Willem Dafoe in Platoon. Uh, and uh, here's that uh, passive writing I love so much or the Kleinian writing more. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looked like they were only a few seconds away from success of tearing open the uh, the ambulance, all the mm -hmm. bots. It looked like they were only a few <laughs> seconds away from success. So, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on tensile strength of various alloys of plate steel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I just didn't want to say they were. I just wanted to hedge my bets in case it was, you know, another four hours until they were able to breach the thing. Yeah, I'm like, confident. Why, why does he do but, that? Like, if, you know, I, if you're going to bet on it, that's got to be on you. You know, it's, you, it could be minutes. Um, I just, right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you where to put your money. I'm, I'm betting on seconds, however. Right. Uh, <laughs> I know, you know, money's a bit tighter for you, so. Well, we finally get to it then, the spider coffin. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, to to his credit, uh, the 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 Chekhov's motive drone spider coffin finally did uh, did pay off in Act Three. And I was surprised by the scale of it. Were you? Uh, you mean uh, how much of important it plays in this final final page? No, of the, the, story? the the actual physical scale of it. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> so the so the, you know we, he did sort of spend a lot of time talking about this in the very beginning, so it was obvious that there was going to be something hinging on it. But then it turns out that the uh, I'm making a lot of Kleinian in allusions, I think, to make up for this. But uh, I, I'm sorry, it's like uh, R2D2, where it's like, oh yeah, you know, oh, I can also fly. Um, yeah, I have a flamethrower built into me. I can, you know, I can literally do whatever the situation calls for. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, he 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 fires it up and starts, um, you know, I guess going up the elevator. Um, I activated the elevator, and the platform to my motive was resting on began to rise toward the surface. But I wasn't rising nearly fast enough for my liking, and after a few seconds, I grew impatient and activated my jump jets. <laughs> this caused the motive to rocket up the length of the elevator shaft and out the launch bay doors at the top, which opened just in the nick of time. Then I hit the jump jets again to lessen the force of my impact, which was still con considerable. So, yeah, just uh, using the jump jets when the situation calls for them. Uh, why not use them from the beginning? Was there any reason to hold them? 
uh, I mean, you know, there's no, um, it doesn't even toss us the bone of like the, the jump jets operated on a nitrous propelled system, which was exceedingly rare. So you had to, <laughs> had to conserve them for when you really need them. All right. So he makes, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think he makes some reference to as he, he went down the, oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, taking great leaping strides on its spidery robotic legs. Each mm-hmm. step I took left an enormous crater in the asphalt behind me. <laughs> so oh, it, it sounds like it's massive. Like it's not a, why is it called a coffin? Uh, he called it a coffin, right? I don't think we're implying that. I think it, it must have been, you know, something he said. Yeah. But it seems like it's the size of a, a house because yes. it's leaving craters and it's, completely impenetrable it's not a coffin at all and uh, yeah so i I don't know if it's just the the weight of the armor is what causes that um but like think about like the massive machinery you see being towed you know going down the you know freeways and stuff that are withstanding that it just must be it's it's a wrecking machine to just leave babbitt road and such (laughs) torn apart right it's a major design flaw i guess then I used the motive's massive metal arms to pick up the ambulance with Miles, Samantha, and Og still inside of it. All of them, mind you, except Og, in their rigs. Yes. Walking, walking on there. I carried it all the way back to my house. <laughs> He's carrying an ambulance with his coffin. Right. While still running and leaving, you know, craters in the massive craters in the road. <sighs> It's not, yeah, it's not. So, yeah, if you, if you think of a coffin, yeah, you've all seen a coffin. It usually takes, what, six, six people to carry a coffin when you're, when you're doing that? Yep. So, they're, you know, they're the size of a, like, I'd say smaller than a queen-size mattress type of thing. Mm-hmm. So, but then this is lifting up an ambulance, so it's either just, like, pound for pound the strongest thing in the world. Um, <laughs> or we've just been misled about how, uh, how, how spacious the motive actually is. I, I mean... Obviously, he got to this point and realized I should have, I should go back and re-describe this, but just didn't, right? I mean, obviously. But I, so yeah, so this is, it, it's quite the scene. He, he, he runs, he, as he's, as he's doing this though, he's in the coffin. Like he's lying there drooling in the coffin as it's lifting up the ambulance and then running home with it over its head. Correct. Right. And then his, so, so that's also just another, you know, funny, you know, if we do a, uh, a split screen for the movie, like it's a funny thing just to see that inside the ambulance as, you know, Wade in the, you know, Oasis is, is controlling it, you know, doing the heroic like gestures and stuff. Cause I assume he's got to do something with his hands to control these spider arms. But then, uh, as it's running home, <laughs> the other one is just like his tongue's lolling out of his mouth as it's lifting up the ambulance. Right. But then, his avatar, when it got the the bot torn to pieces, he, I assume the haptic suit is off of his avatar now. And uh, so his avatar is just standing in the castle doing uh, the bobbing up and down. Oh, like I a guess cartoon. so, yeah. He's tapping his foot, <laughs> filing his nails. <laughs> or uh, is it, uh, does he have a vid feed of his avatar? That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, it's terrible. But you know, but the other thing I, I wondered is, you know, so this <laughs> you've got all of a sudden this uh, this spider coffin is tearing down the road, um, and you know this is the house where Ogden lived, where Wade currently lives. Like, <laughs> what are the neighbors thinking as all this is happening? <laughs> I don't know. Look, but, the world's on the brink of disaster. There's a spider coffin running down the middle of the street, ruining the asphalt. Who cares? Right. You know. <laughs> But I, I went looking um, just to see if there was any sort of like uh, simulation of like because a lot of details are getting laughed out here. He's 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 in he's got the home stretch in his sights. He's he's eyeing his uh, you know five o'clock martini as he's gonna you know finish out these last twenty five pages or whatever. Um, so it was up to gallant reenactors on the dark web to sort of fill in these blanks. And I'm oh. looking and I found people who had you know sort of been like oh well this is the real question like what is what are the uh, elderly couple who live on this street doing in the meantime as this thing starts racing back and forth on on Babbitt Road. Oh wow! Okay. Um, did you find anything? Yes. Oh, no. you did. Okay. <laughs> I was okay. talking this up to uh, just you know I went looking. Nothing turned up, but it was you know it's always fun cruising around the dark web. 
yes, I found something. Uh, well, that would I, be very Kleinian of you to set true. up the tension and then say, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Samantha had erased all of the yeah. simulations. My, my search has turned up empty. Uh, yes, I found something. Let's listen to it now. This is what uh, an elderly couple uh, just enjoying their evening on Babbitt Road uh, might have might have sounded like if this if they saw the spider coffin racing by. Well. Lovely night on Babbitt Road, ain't it, Reba? Nah, sure is, Hubert. Great for port sitting. These rocking chairs, so relaxing. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying my lemonade. Nice breeze. Mm. You know, Carolyn reached out, said Frank's took a turn for the worse. Mm. That's a shame. Mm, sure is. Should be a nice sunset. Say, Reba. Yes, Hubert? Looks like one of them newfangled spider coffins is walking down the street. Mm. You look to be right on that one, Hubert. Sort of ruins the relaxing mood. Mm. Oh, look at that. It tore up the hydrangea in Judas' front yard. She'll be sick. Oh, she loved those plants. Hey. Hey, is anyone in there? Hey, jerk. Oh, Hubert. Well, look at him. He's leaving enormous craters in the asphalt. You know how long it's going to take for that to get fixed? How will goods and workers get to Babbitt Road? Hubert? Yes, Reba? The year is like 2044, right? Hmm, sounds about right, Reba, but I'm foggy on some of the particulars here. Yeah, yeah, they're really not important, but, uh, we're in our mid-80s, which means we were born in, like, 1960? Uh, we're pretty much the same age as the kid on the Wonder Years, yeah. Yeah. So, when did life get so stupid? Hmm, what do you mean? Well, do you know, uh, the 90s had their faults and all, but, uh... At least huge spider coffins never ran down your streets tearing up the concrete. I guess things just changed so gradually. Well, there weren't spider coffins as late as 2021, so when exactly did all this sort of start? Well, let's, let's give it a rest, Reba. Enjoy our evening. <sighs> Sounds good. Hmm. I hear Wheel of Fortune's broadcasting from Hawaii this week. Oh, that's always fun. Well, son of a... Looks like another spider coffin. Now, what's it holding? It looks to be a full-sized ambulance. Hmm. I think you're right, Hubert. You know, when people started saying sports ball, that's when I think things went downhill. Oh, for sure, for sure. How's the coffin going to get over the crater it left in Babbitt Street the last time it came through? Well, here's it's activating its jump jets. Shh, jump jet. I know, I know. Oh, look at that. The spider coffin has a fun vanity plate. 42. A joke. I love jokes. You know, when I was on city council, I introduced that bill to forcibly sterilize anyone who bought a DeLorean. You were right to do so, honey. You were right to do so. Well, there you have it. Um, you had uh, Hubert and Reba of uh, Babbitt Road observing the, the coffin going back and forth. Well, I'm glad you were able to find that. Yeah, me too. Lots of brave reenactors out there doing their, doing their part. <laughs> oh, so chapter 27 is nearly at an end. I believe they, they say that uh, the only way to destroy Anorak is, of course, the Dork Slayer, something that's been mentioned, I guess. Um, and, uh, but they need Og to A, regain consciousness, and then B, log into the Oasis in order to wield it. Yes. I believe the Dork Slayer was something that when we did one of the fanfics, I think it came up a, a few times, and I believe you rejected the 
You rejected any uh, sample that had the Dork Slayer in it. <laughs> See, there's no way that comes back. It can't possibly. Yeah, but nope, That's uh, everything's going to hinge on it, and it's going to depend on an uh, elderly man who just got shot in the chest or something to, uh, to log into the <laughs> Oasis to wield it. Uh, yeah, Chapter 28 starts with uh, some good stuff. He does, in fact, I didn't realize, I must have glossed over this, he disengaged from his Telebot control rig and climbed out of it. Okay. So his avatar had to actually climb into something. Climb out of the other avatar rig, uh, and he walked over to the window, and Anorak was still there, hovering outside the window <laughs> sill. <laughs> oh. When he taunts him, and then he says, uh, "But in the way of a reply, I simply gave him the finger." Nice. Yep. Yeah. Sweet. We, uh, we, yeah, we were just a, probably a, a heroic editor, like being like, I will retire for whatever if you, uh, if you have one of the, one of these two moon each other, like full pressed on the glass type of thing. <laughs> pressed ham. <yes. laughs> uh, this was the famous, uh, took a deep breath. How the fuck do you negotiate with a piece of software? <laughs> right. Which, yep. uh, I believe fooled one of us. I I'm don't sure remember. it did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, what, and what the whole point of this is, is that Anorak is a, is a trying to win over uh, Kira. And he says, you know, he's sort of just like, um, hey, like, I still think this can happen. I, I'm, I'm a lot faster on my feet than flesh and blood Halliday ever was. And I'm a much faster learner, too. I think I may be able to win Kira over after a decade or two. <laughs> <laughs> so this piece of software is giving himself 10, 20 years tops to, uh, you know, sort of Phil Connors his way into, yeah, into having this girl love him. <laughs> Groundhog Day. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so he sets up the tension that he's going to use the space arc to, mm -hmm. uh, just float in space, you know, just keeping his digital self alive, but ruining, you know, killing all of humanity. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the tension. Uh, he's like, oh, you're, I suppose you've got a standalone simulation outside the oasis where you plan to live. And then he says, uh, after our conversation, the first thing Samantha had done upon logging out was to take the data uplink to Arcadia physically offline. So no matter what happened, Anarik would be stuck here on Earth. Tension dissipated immediately. <laughs> and also backdating the uh, that piece of information. Yep. Oh, I forgot to mention, there was the, an action scene where Samantha like did the clickety-clickety, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, but took it offline, yeah. I mean, yep. but yeah, it, by all rights, there should have been some sort of, you know, that should have been a standalone chapter, you know. Right. The alone the in a dark room, of the Samantha. VPN. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Nope. It just uh, happened. So that tension gone. There's no way that. Uh, uh, so he's a toothless enemy at this point anyway, no well, matter what well, happens. Well, well, we have another action scene coming up right away, though, because uh, oh, the virtual Anorak has an email that Halliday sent to Ogden just before he died uh, that he wants Wade to uh, read. And, you know, he does this sort of like, get to know your idol a little bit better. And it's like, no, no, uh, he, he has renounced him multiple times throughout the book. <laughs> he's, he's well aware of that he's a pretty, pretty garbage person. But my first instinct was like, how, how is he going to read this? Like, <laughs> how is he going to possibly... Uh, be able to read an email and he says I nodded and pulled the window closer to my eyes then I enlarged the font size so that its <laughs> contents were easier to read <laughs> oh my god <laughs> what is happening why so the worst possible thing would be sort of the um, here uh, look at my phone I have the, here's a funny thing that your idol did you should really oh. see that. Uh, hang on, I can't get my phone. Oh, oh, damn it! I'm getting a text. You know that would that's the worst version right. of it. Wait, auto rotate He's, isn't on. I had that off, so you need to <laughs> drop, pull that down, no. turn it on, so you can watch come it around here. Yeah. Uh, your screen's really dark. Yeah, I know. I can't. Damn, I took it off auto, and now it's. Uh, hang on a sec. And no, it keeps being the, like. Here's the good part. Oh wait, no wait, it, it's coming up. And then he like, right. over over laughs every time something funny happens, watching over his shoulder. Right, and then it skips the part that he actually wanted him to see. Oh, it ended before. Oh, shit, that was, I had the wrong file. Hang Here's on a an second. Why don't you have an ad blocker installed? Oh, well, you, you, if you want. <laughs> I, I believe the creator should be paid for their efforts. Sorry if that's my opinion. <laughs> that would be a way better version than this. He pulls out an email and waves it in front of his eyes. 
And it's not a short email. <laughs> it's a very, 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 very long email. Oh, no. I've enlarged the font size too much. Now there's just like three words per page. This is going to be impossible to read. And so he sits and reads it while the, his arch enemy hovers outside of a window. <laughs> it is... It, you couldn't come up with a worse situation. This is absolutely indescribably bad. Right. And the email, you know, so it's mostly him sort of like, I guess, repenting. But it had a, a one sentence that I thought was truly just a, a chilling one. Like if you, even if you, you know, if you died or something and, and they were like, hey, like, you know, you're going to want to show up to this. Mike had a pretty prominent thing set aside for you and his will. If if this sentence was read, I'd be out of there before any, you know, gifts were rewarded. Now that I'm gone, I need you to know a few things. Things I was too ashamed to reveal to anyone while I was still alive. Nope, I'm out. Don't yep, need to sorry. know this about the person. I, you know, yep. Location of I'll his brony keep, jar or whatever he's like. You know. I'll, I'll keep my memory as it <laughs> yes, is. Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> his estate can, yeah, charity. Give it to charity. I'm good. Uh, the beautiful thing is, of course, that no writer can convey another person's writing you know, better than their their own ability to do so, and uh, and this guy writes like Klein. You know, it's just terrible, terrible. Oh right, writing. yeah. And you just think about this is one of the smartest pr- people who's ever lived. You know, he would mm-hmm. constantly get updates on his massive intellect, and it's just a dumbass writing an email, <laughs> <laughs> an absolute Klein of a human being. Yes. Um, the email also contains, uh, I'm just going to get ahead of it. I, I think it could be the, the dumbest sentence of the book. Okay. Wow. That is um, tall, tall order, but go ahead. Just taken on its own. If you saw this, uh, you know, on it, uh, just wild, um, it, it should be the top Goodreads quote of this book. I, maybe our, our listeners can get it there. I sincerely apologize for copying your wife without her knowledge or permission. <laughs> I had uh, uh, all my money on that sentence, and nice. I was right. It's it's like uh, you know, it's like a, a drill tweet or something like that. It's just a you know a, a parody of you know I, I'm sorry I break danced at your funeral type of thing from from Twitter <laughs> circa 2013. Like <laughs> it was wrong. Is the whole... Yes, yes, I, I realize, realize that now. That now. <laughs> Because Lucosia explained it to me. So she was like, she sat him down. She she pulled down the, the screen. She had the PowerPoint, why it was wrong to copy your wife presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's, yeah, and he's doing the thing like, I'm, I'm learning and I will grow from it. Yes. I am be- people are teaching me that my actions were wrong. <laughs> He's issued a uh, an apology written in his. It is. It's essentially that that cliched thing of the uh, the notes app that you post on your your Instagram when you've mistakenly, uh, you know, <laughs> I did not realize that my uh, my my efforts to create a viral TikTok were actually mirroring uh, Nazi imagery. I, I sincerely apologize. I right. picked out of the TikTok <laughs> house. <laughs> I did not realize that setting up dog fighting rings was something that I should not be doing. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's you know it, it's. Uh, you, it's it's not meant to be funny at all, but it's uh, that's the main the main drama that this is hinging on here. Yeah, and we get uh, he he gets to this repeated thing maybe only a couple times, but it is odd. Everyone who refers to death, sa- he says this: the Grim Reaper finally asked me to dance, and I did the Mortal Coil Shuffle. Oh, God. And it comes up. It comes up later. Another character says the same thing. Yes. That's the only thing that Klein knows to uh, refer to death. As, I don't but. think they were meant to be related either. They're just uh, no. They're not re- meant to be related. It's like one of those. You know, um, I think we've talked about it before, but Stephen King puts in a lot characters who say things that you only hear characters saying, like you know. Well, I'm like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. It's like no yeah. one has ever actually said that, but you, everyone somehow knows that saying. You know, he's crazier right. than a shithouse rat. Like, it's like no one... He couldn't pour piss out of a boot if the directions were on the heel. You know. <laughs> yeah, they're the, just uh, things that uh, crusty football players in movies say, football right. coaches say. They're not <laughs> actual things. But uh, so we get a, a, a good look at... Um, Again, things are not meant to be funny, but I think that the way that Ernest Klein, um, in all his his, his wisdom and, and worldliness, shows how how different cultures are handling grieving. 
This is would sort of be yeah. a good um, you know moment for the movie, like panning across various people. Everyone in the world is imprisoned in these things, but we get a, a, a gl- glimpse into how um, two people handle this. And it's uh, Shoto's wife and his parents gathered around his immersion vault, all of their heads bowed solemnly. <laughs> um, so those are that's the Japanese uh, way of mourning. Uh, another vid feed window gave me a view of H's immersion vault in her home in L.A. Her fiancé, Endira, was lying on top of it, wailing over it as if it were a closed casket. Um, I don't know anything about Endira, um, but <laughs> I did... I did note the differences in those two uh, in those two grieving techniques. He's he's a master of cultures. He knows <laughs> he he knows what it's about. Uh, we should note, however, that Indira probably had to get one of those uh, giant telescoping aluminum ladders that you do the <laughs> cl- gutter cleaning with, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, and and climb up that, and because uh, it's it's got to be at least twenty feet tall, or. Com- Yep, completely I mean, massive. It's like a uh, able like to pick a, up an ambulance. Yeah, above ground pool or something. That's the uh, what we're talking about, I think. Or maybe you, the the spider arms give. At, maybe you could sort of shimmy up the spider arms or something mm-hmm. when they're when they're. I don't know how they uh, how they are in the resting state, but maybe those provide <laughs> access. Yeah, because otherwise, if it is, if you're if you're thinking about like a sensory deprivation tank, you're thinking about a fairly smooth, you know, pill like type of object. So yeah, got to be a real challenge to sort of uh, shimmy on up there without sliding back down. Uh, may I suggest uh, next time, Indira, just kind of solemnly bow your head. All right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we'll play you a, a gong sound effect if that's what's needed to uh, to get you to do that. I did note though that this moment. We joked about this the whole book, about you know his uh, grieving widow and family gathered around Shoto's thing. The fact that it actually came true <laughs> really right. made me laugh. <laughs> right, I As remember you know, all of this garbage of going through John Hughes' world. This is what was happening. Yeah, yeah, they they knew they were locked in, and so as Shoto was playing a DDR, and wasn't he like horn dogging over some like. A prostitute or something in Prince in Prince's world. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> we do. We just have them, so you know, their their hands folded, and uh, um, I'm, I'm sure wearing their uh, ceremonial grieving robes in Ernest Klein's head. Right. Um, but uh, so we, we we the the last chapter ended with him uh, uh, hammering home the effects of synaptic overload syndrome. Mm-hmm. which was described as an ice pick of pain slammed into my brain and the world seemed to tilt wildly for a minute. Catastrophic synaptic overload, knocking loudly on my front door now, reminding me I'd already pushed myself past my limits. And how did he recover from that? I blinked my eyes clear <laughs> and, and went on with the technique. But but now it's back again. Anorak grinned as he looked over at me. He could probably tell I was already suffering the effects of synaptic overload syndrome as a result of being logged in for nearly 12 straight hours. I'm just like, you've been, you've been on, the, the catastrophic overload has been happening now for, for 90 pages? Yeah. Like, just, you know, yeah, keep explaining this to us, because it's going to really stick one of these times. Uh, um, yeah, it's like uh, any action movie where the, you know, the hero gets shot or something. It's like, well, that's that. And then, you know, in the next act, they're just like, there's a tiny blood spot on their shirt or whatever. Like, what happened to that? That was a big moment. You got shot. Um, no, just keep it in mind. Keep it sort of lightly in mind that right. he any might action, or might not be suffering it. Any action movie where there's a bomb timer ticking down and it cuts to it and it's like, you know, uh, three minutes and 50 seconds. And then they have like a lengthy scene of the president getting a phone call and you know, it cuts back to it, you know, three minutes and 20 seconds type of thing. Yes. <laughs> He's been... This has been a, the death of him is coming for a long time and it's happening again. He says, I also realized I was grinding my teeth and I was starting to feel like I had a migraine coming on. Synaptic overload syndrome, I said. The symptoms are starting to set in. That part was back during the Cimmerillion test. Yes, they that, already were. I yes. copied and pasted that from, from 60 pages ago. So it immediately kills you very gradually is how this, uh, this dreaded thing works. Well, he had obviously he's yeah, he's dying by a thousand cuts here of his own choices. But one of them is that uh, you know Shoto and H and all of them were supposed to have died. Anorak just then he realized that like oh crap, I'm not going to go back and fix that. So Anorak says no, they're alive and well, all of them. 
I program the ONI firmware so that when a user hits their usage limit, they remain trapped but in a dreamless sleep-like state. <laughs> okay, so that uh, that thing is solved and right. it goes away. They're just sitting there. But uh, so and, wouldn't that be something like a desirable effect? Yeah. You know, you could sort of go into hibernate mode as opposed to, you know, grinding your teeth and having your brain melt out your ears. Like it, it seems like he invent, invented something that would greatly benefit this new oasis. Well, I think that he's just saying it is like this is supposed to be uh, the softer side, the right. apologetic side of sure. Shannon Right. Right. You're still I a guess. human in there somewhere type of thing. Yeah. I'm not the monster you think I am, he says. <laughs> then we get uh, three or four paragraphs of, again, he's drooling and having, uh, you know, uh, optical migraines, mm -hmm. uh, shards through his brain. Yeah. Numbness in his extremities, I'm sure. But there's plenty of time for a. Uh, a little bit of qu uh, quoting from uh, Star Trek. Nice. And a little bit of uh, 80s uh, villain tisk tisk tisking, <laughs> uh, back and forth. Uh, like, this just goes on forever. And then, then they come to the agreement that they're going to have a battle to the death. Yeah. But uh, they... Just mano a mano. Mm -hmm. But he uses uh, uh, the classic playground technique of, I never said who you were going to have to fight. That's right. Um, and that's after they call each other nerds and doofuses. Doofus, yes. The the world's collective intelligence says, you're not going to win, doofus. <laughs> and he says, uh, SOS is, going, is already frying your neurons. Right. Well, maybe that's why his uh, incult, insult capacity is at a, uh, operating at around 30%. Although, you know, uh, I guess he was saying stuff like, you know, I, I, I don't remember the... the but uh, the the banter from the book for previous book when there was no SOS was like go fuck a duck or something like that. <laughs> yeah. so, so the bar is um, not high to begin with. And uh, the chapter ends with uh, what was, I believe, a piece of real or fanfic that obviously fooled someone uh -huh. as giant og, a power, great and powerful og hovering in the air says, "Hey nerd, why don't you pick on someone your own size?" <laughs> and chapter end. God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just looked it up, and uh, you're not going to win, Doofus. Is you know he's actually quoting there. That was uh, Bobby Fischer to Boris Spassky at the famous Reykjavik uh, chess tournament. Ah, uh, got it. That's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How embarrassing for me. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually a very high-toned uh, quote there. That was uh, yeah, maybe a Burr or Hamilton. One of them said yeah. that to each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, chapter twenty-nine. Uh, yeah, this is uh, another one of your of your favorite things where, uh, you know, setting up stakes and then immediately taking all the air out of them. Mm hmm. This is uh, so they show up in these two, you know, the old friends, but they're finally facing off once and for the final time. And it's uh, it's like Kong versus Godzilla. It's the, the Clash of the Titans. Tines of blue lightning erupted from Og's fingertips and blasted him backwards several hundred yards before he collided with a mountain creating a large impact crater that immediately started an avalanche. Anorak was buried under tons of rock in a matter of seconds. But moments later, he exploded up out of the rubble looking completely unharmed. <laughs> so immediately establishing that even the most intense actions have zero effect. Uh, they're meaningless. The stakes are, we have no idea what is actually at work here. Yeah, this is the uh, the robots, uh, the robot fight, the T one thousand versus what was the other model? I don't know. Oh anyway. yeah, maybe he was the one hundred. I don't know. Yeah, eight hundred. I'm not sure. Hitting each other with the you know full out smashes in the jaw with urinals, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but he's fine. It just yep. makes a like dink sound, and uh, he shakes off the dust of an, an avalanche of mountains, and everything is fine. Yeah, and uh, we got blue lightning now. I believe we've had purple lightning in Prince's World and red lightning um, as they were driving out, like into uh, in, or riding the uh, horses in Cimmerillion Land. Right, right. Uh, we get this description: Og and Anorak began to grapple with each other. I believe this was in fanfic mm -hmm. as they careened across the heavens, throwing boulder-crushing punches at each other like Superman and General Zod, <laughs> while they shouted things only the two of them could hear. Ooh. How do you know that they were shouting things <laughs> if you can't hear them? Right. It's just a just a question of logic there. But what there were, it so, is. what do you think they what do you think they were shouting? Like, I'm sorry, I copied your wife. <laughs> I a, suppose that's so. a great one for a, in a Harrison Ford voice. <laughs> I'm sorry, I copied your wife. <laughs> it was wrong. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so this is that was the the fanfic episode where he compared it to Yoda and Palpatine, Nero, uh, Neo, and Agent Smith, and it seemed like he was aware, or at least got told by an editor that listen, you're you're going into some pretty heavy turf here with your your epilogue, so get all this crap out of your system now. Yeah, just uh, and the the action as described, what he's essentially doing is saying just imagine all the movies you've ever seen of you know CGI large CGI creatures just smashing each other around. That's mm-hmm. what's happening. Yep, Transformers, he, essentially. Yeah, he doesn't actually describe it. Uh, well, not very well, anyway. <laughs> uh, here's a question. What the hell is going on here? I quote the first one here. And since I had such a great view, so he's just sitting in the castle looking mm-hmm. at it, I decided to air everything I was seeing on my POV channel so the whole world could tune in. Uh, paragraph later. That was when I noticed the broadcast invitation icon flashing on my HUD, an indication that one of the handful of people on my friends list was currently doing a live broadcast of their avatar's POV. When I tapped the icon, I discovered it was Og. Og was broadcasting this battle with Anorak live to the entire Oasis. Uh Uh-huh. He he was already doing that. I don't understand what... why, why, Why does he care if... It's like he just has a different view... Uh, <laughs> it's like the Major League Baseball uh, app that they used to have. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where you they control the action. They couldn't show the edited version, so they just had each camera, and you had to choose which one you wanted to look at. And it was uh, terrible. The experience right. was terrible. Right. But that's like, what he's describing here is like someone pings him, hey, I've got a different POV camera. Oh, cool. <laughs> that's what he's intending to say, right? Or did yeah. he forget that he was already broadcasting it? Well, he's broadcasting his own view, so he's he's watching from the tower. But then Og is doing it from his eyes, I guess, type of thing. Like you know, while while uh, Anorak was buried in the mountain rubble, Og like you know scrolled through his thing and decided to start broadcasting to like I don't know, get some twitch points or something. I guess it just didn't seem to warrant an entire other. Let's it, just it, ass- let's just assume everyone can see this crap. Like, what do you? Why do you have to describe? <laughs> I, it, 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 it's truly baffling. And then he says, at some point in time, as they're blasting each other, even though it doesn't affect them, to my horror, I saw that an army of Anorak's acolytes had begun to erupt via teleportation. In just a few seconds, there were hundreds of thousands of them. I was worried they were all planning to try to gang up on Og, but they remained on the sidelines watching like spectators at a prize fight. They all began to broadcast their POVs to the rest of the Oasis too. And it suddenly became possible to watch the battle from hundreds of different locations and angles. <laughs> like, what, what, what do you, <laughs> can you just not help yourself? Like, what is, you know, it's like, are you, there's a hundred thousand of them there all broadcasting this. So if you search for Og Anorak footage, like who's scrolling to the, you know, page 12,932 to watch that guy's POV feed? I don't know. Does he, does he think that it's cool? It's like a, uh. You know, you bought a piece of software you no longer use and you keep getting you keep forgetting to dump the email that sends you right. like, great news. We've updated a feature that allows you now to scan your inbox without ever going to, you know, like, I, right. I don't care. I don't email from Foursquare or something. Like, but he's in the middle of this Transformers battle and he can't stop describing the, the minor updates to the software that allows him to see what he's actually describing. <laughs> and also, you know. People people have a lot on their mind at this moment. Like I don't think uh, you know Shoto's grieving widow is has her head bowed solemnly. I don't think she's like being like she has no understanding that these two guys are are what's going to solve her husband regaining consciousness. I don't think she's going to tune in to see them, you know, throwing each other through the Eiffel Tower or whatever the hell set piece they're doing. Maybe well, she's solemnly bowing her head. She's you know privately sneaking one eye open and scanning through the different feeds <laughs> right. this is a pretty good fight oh he just threw him into a mountain oh right i'm grieving my uh yeah my husband is, is she accidentally dead. locks eyes with shoto's uncle who's doing the same thing and they just sort of yeah. they do a like he, 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 like shh type of thing right it's the uh you know sitcom thing of uh, someone at a funeral like quietly watching a football game and mm-hmm. they you know the dad comes over what are you doing there is that the army navy game yeah. i want in on this i got 50 bucks on navy yeah. Uh, but also, here, answer me this question. The hundreds of thousand people that are also broadcasting their POVs, Anorak's acolytes? Mm-hmm. Who are they? Who are they? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I was wondering myself. I did, so I did a, I did a control F for, for the word acolyte. This is the first mention of it that we have. Um, so we have not been told who these people are. At some point in time, you know, he said all the NPCs had turned on like Westworld. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. And so that it must be what he's referring to, but this this implies that they're like characters in the Oasis who are, you know, evil, who worship this bad guy who's imprisoning everyone. I, because otherwise these NPCs are showing up to broadcast their vid feeds to everybody. It doesn't make much sense. <laughs> <laughs> Does, doesn't make much sense. Just put a put a yes. pin in that. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so Artemis, who is currently in an ambulance on yeah. a treadmill. In an ambulance. Out, yeah. On a treadmill, in an ambulance, uh, outside of Wade's mansion, I guess, where I presume his spider coffin dropped the ambulance down. You know, like on his, you know, right. put, it, put it on cinder blocks in his front yard or something. Yes. So, yes, she's it's up on blocks. Uh, she's standing next to who else is in in the ambulance still? Like Aug is bleeding, but he's got an ONI on, right? He's dying. Well, yeah, Aug Aug is strapped into the rig so he could do this. I believe um, I think we covered this in a fanfic, but Miles was shot and killed. Right. Okay. By a drone or something. So while this is happening, then Artemis logs in or, or shows up with her uh, shows up to fight to do battle. Yes. Uh, and she's immediately killed. <laughs> it is a uh, maybe two or three sentences of, of before that tension is resolved. Yes. So she, uh, all of her stuff gets picked up by Anorak. He's still the intelligence of the world. Still is is like picking up uh, you know medicine packs and food from uh, from other people's avatars. And Wade says he desperately wanted to fly down to retrieve her inventory, but he was too weak to move. And he made a big show of that every time Shoto and, and H got killed too. He's like, I ran down and picked up all their yeah, their their uh, bug nets and the uh, uh, jars and the you know wand of Gamelon or whatever. Uh, well, here you go. Here's a perfect storm of Klein here. So many things to say about this. When Og saw Anorak kill Artemis, he looked completely enraged, even though he must have known that even though... Yep, I'm going to read that again. Even though he must have known that even though her avatar was dead, oh. Samantha was still alive and well in the real world. Maybe he'd forgotten. Oh, What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> the duel even those is like a... Uh... Oh, it's like a knife in the eye. But yeah, just the ideas here. That Og looked completely enraged. Was he? No, who knows? <laughs> uh, the narrator does not tell us. He looked that way, could be mistaken. It's up to you, reader. Who knows? Maybe he'd forgotten that Samantha was actually alive. How could he forget, you <laughs> stupid moron? What are you talking about? This is what he does. Every He invented, he invented the, the world. System. Yes. <laughs> uh, th he this is high-level badness from Klein here. I mean, he's, oh, yeah. reaching, he's reaching new heights of... Just that would have been, absolute. I would have, that would have been maybe one that if it came in as fanfic, I'd be like, I'm not using this because it's so poorly written that like, I feel bad <laughs> yeah. for the person who sent it in. Like, I don't want to, yes. <laughs> I don't want their name attached to it. And Mike clearly won't think it's real. So I'm not even going to use it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this, this is, is another, a, no, go ahead. Uh, well, it just like we had, we had the horrible sentence before, but it's just worth drilling down on another aspect of from that moment on Og and Anorak were. Locked in a knockdown, drag out man versus machine fight to the death that seemed like it might go on forever. So it's like, oh, man versus machine. We all know some of those classic, you know, John Henry versus the train, um, Kasparov versus Deep Blue. But he doesn't. He doesn't mean that. He says Yoda versus Palpatine, Gandalf versus <laughs> Soromon, and I guess Neo Agent Smith is sort of like that. But he could have just, you know, if that's what you're going for. But they're also both machines. They're both digital avatars. Um, it's yeah. It just is a, as we've said before, these hit the the unforced error button yet again. Yes. Um. Oh, oh, here we go. I got one here. He seemed to recognize the ornate runes carved into its silver blade because his eyes widened in an expression <laughs> that could only be described as absolute terror. I just was like, we got another one. That's a talk about a gift. Even at his, the height of what he's, this is, you know, it's all come to this. He can't help himself. <laughs> yes. He is still Klein. He can't climb out of his shell. That's like in a, in a, you know, a baseball route where you, you, you let the pitcher bat for himself in the ninth inning and he hits a home run to put you up like 16 to two. <laughs> That's what's getting <laughs> a, uh, one more could only be described at uh, with yes. 20 pages left in the book. 
<laughs> I, I picked up on something. See if you can pick up on this sort of um, this crutch that he starts using uh, to describe this action sequence. Um, it's sort of subtle, but pay attention. This is like five different sentences. At that exact moment, Lohengrin arrived on the scene. In the same moment, Anorak pulled himself free of the ground. Just as he activated it, Og did an evasive sidestep. Anorak turned to face him, just as Og swung the Dork Slayer. Oh, God. The moment after he killed Anorak, all of the color drained out of his face. <laughs> Hair what? trigger uh, exact moments and just as things happen in this, uh, in this action sequence. That's five within the span of, I think, two and a half pages. Well, it's... That's what I mean. That's part of his his genius of not even being able to describe. Like, if you act, act, asked a two year old, like, what happened? Yeah. You know, he he walked in and he picked up the glass and he spilled the water. Yeah. And then and then and then. <laughs> but it's not at that moment. Like, yeah, you're describing what's happening. We mm-hmm. that is the moment. We yeah. things we don't do happen know. simultaneously and in response to things. <laughs> yes. He's. Uh, he also uses a thing. Uh, I just had a. It's not in my notes, but I just saw an a, a example scroll by because he used it earlier. The good news was, you know, Og was still alive. The bad news was. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yes. And there's another one in here. Uh, if you again, your third grade teacher would go, "Come on, Mike, you're better than this. You right. can't. That's not the way to describe." <laughs> <laughs> the good news was we saw the white whale. The bad news was <laughs> terrible. Uh, but at least we do get more uh, inventory management. Um, it says, because uh, Lohengrin shows up and pretty much does the same thing as Samantha. She shows up with the dork slayer to save the day, immediately is killed, leaving behind a pile of inventory that Anorak scooped up. Uh, then he turned back to face Og, flashing him a self-satisfied grin, but then Og kills him with the dork slayer. Anorak's avatar slowly vanished, leaving behind the biggest loot drop in history. Og was standing right in the middle of it, so all of Anorak's items were automatically added to his inventory, but Og didn't seem to notice. <laughs> just so, just major focus on this in the, as, the, as the book draws to a close. Maybe he forgot. You know, <laughs> true. Yeah, it's true. just like forgetting that people weren't actually dying when they were killed. <laughs> When their avatar was killed. Or he's just, uh, you know, has a more level-headed head on his shoulders as, as he is about to die as well. Uh, doesn't really care that he's picked up the, uh, you know, bag of holding or whatever. Right. Oh, here was the, uh, I came across the, the uh, best example of the putting a, a worthless thing in parentheses at the end of an already bad idea. Okay, nice. <laughs> when this happened, the user was automatically logged out of the Oasis and an ambulance was summoned to their real world location. Parentheses, if one was on file. <laughs> <laughs> they forgot to click the, uh, the, the confirmation email to verify your identity so they don't have their address uh, confirmed. <laughs> oh, wow. God. And it's, it's completely unnecessary. The whole thing is completely unnecessary, but the parenthetical really super triple uh, platinum level unnecessary made me laugh. <laughs> It's like one of those towns you hear where like the people didn't pay for the uh, the fire insurance, so the the fire fire truck shows up and they're like, "Here, take it now!" And they're like, "You didn't pay for it. Like, sorry, your address wasn't on file. No, uh, no, no ambulance is coming to your house." Yes, but uh, so it does seem like um, Anorak was was true to his word, and uh, everyone's just going to wake up and be fine from this. Um, yep. But uh, it's, it, he does say, due to the effects of synaptic overload system. Uh, and my complete physical and mental exhaustion, I immediately passed out and lost consciousness again. Then I was dead to the world. Which, in a book full of bad things happening, that's, you know, we got something we can be happy about there. And yet, <laughs> mere sentences, mere words later, I didn't wake up again until the following day, a little over 15 hours later. <laughs> well, all right, I have this note. Let's go back to that. Uh, first of all, it's... It, you know, he's trying to do a chapter and like dot, 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 right? Mm-hmm. I immediately, of course, un- <laughs> utterly unnecessary, just circle the immediately in this book and you'll never stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, passed out. And okay, done. And lost consciousness <laughs> again. Okay, so he's passed out. He's made it completely clear. Then I was dead to the world. So he's dead. Yes. 
because he's but, he'd already <laughs> passed out. Right. To but lose consciousness while passing out is that's you know that's high level uh, unconsciousness. So the then can only mean that he died. There is no you can't extra double pass out, right? I mean, I, dead to the world can be a synonym for lost consciousness, but he already said he passed out and lost consciousness. So he's already double passed out. So then I was dead to the world. It can only mean that he's 100% dead. He has done the mortal coil shuffle at this yeah. point. Yes. But then he It could only be up. described as, I was dead. <laughs> that is just terrible. Where's the editor? I, 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 yeah, he's not dead. That just you know, he's waking up 15 hours later. So like, you know, one of those nights in you know, following like New Year's Eve when you were 22, you're like somehow you managed to sleep for 15 hours, like because you were up till three in the morning type of thing. <laughs> like that's all it was, just like sort of one of those type of hangovers. Uh, so I didn't know whether he was at this point. I assumed this is um, digital, you know, that he was dead, and I thought we were already in that world. Uh huh. But no, we get like the hospital, you know. Oh, right. We, we get we get the cliched hospital, yeah, uh, which is pretty painful. Uh, hey there, Sleeping Beauty, she said just before she planted a kiss on me. God. Hey there, Prince Charming, I replied once the kiss was finally over. <laughs> <laughs> so she went in for full, like a full, like uh, you know, smooch with tongue and you know all that for the guy who just regained consciousness. I I guess so. I just love that even in moments like simple, you can't mess this up moments, he's still climbing. (laughs) I replied once the kiss was finally over, (laughs) which could, first of all, the fact that he has to describe it after the fact. But then also, what does that mean? The kiss was finally over. Like, oh, thank God that's finally over. (laughs) Yeah, someone's clearing their throat as the kiss enters second 22. Like, (laughs) uh. Uh, But he also says... As he's sort of like, you know, explaining everything that happened while he was dead to the world. Uh, For reasons I'm still not sure I understand, Anorak had told the truth. He'd programmed his hacked ONI firmware to suspend all headset activity once a user hit their usage limit, but to keep them logged in. This prevented all of his hostages from suffering the effects of synaptic overload syndrome. Every single main character has suffered the effect of synaptic overload syndrome. You've explicitly detailed the symptoms like chattering teeth and hysterical laughter. You passed out from it on the previous page of the book. I I don't know. I don't know what's happening. It's one of those things where it's just you're constantly on the verge of suffering from it, which means you're suffering from it. You know, if I'm like, I have I have the flu. I I have I have chills, aches. I'm, 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 I'm getting a fever. I'm not on the verge of having the flu. <laughs> I, I am currently suffering the, the, the debilitating effects of it. Like, there's no, there's no, it's not, a, it's not a binary thing of zero and one. Again, I think he just was, uh, is overdriving his headlights here and, and just didn't realize that he had to solve it. So he just pretended that he never said that they were or something. I don't, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> who, who can explain it? Uh, I forgot before uh, we got to that moment, um, uh, I shifted my eyes to the right and saw H and Shoto smiling at me from vid feed windows. That's how you describe seeing people. I shifted. <laughs> <laughs> Again, when uh, how did Ahab see the uh, white whale? Yes. Oh, I forgot to mention he had shifted his eyes to the right where <laughs> the whale was. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, a- a- Ahab at the, uh, in the in the climactic scene as he's, you know, hell's heart I stab at thee. Then he was dead to the world. <laughs> he woke up in his chamber 12, hour, 12 hours later to uh, to Queequeg and uh, standing over him. Yeah, arms folded. Well, look who came about finally. <laughs> oh, Once the Queequeg. kiss had finally ended, he said, uh, oh, Ishmael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, so that's all August died. Um, you've, you've got the, the cliche of uh, he, he, it was like he had summoned all his strength to hold on just long enough to do what needed to be done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like that. It was like that had happened. But then uh, as they're sort of talking about this, she says uh, Artemis nodded and gave me a thumbs up. She was still in shock from losing Og. I think I may have been too. You, you, you know, I, once again, we'll just take your word on this. It, it, you are the narrator. You can, right. you can let us in on it, but just as a classic Klein bit that uh, really you're, takes the cake at this point in you're time. Our, you're our only source, so we're relying on you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, that's uh, I think that's the end of that. He 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 decides he's logging back in one more time to yeah, the he oasis. Pulls the IV out of his arm and mm. uh, and uh, and why is it? Wait, why is he in the hospital? Because no one was going to suffer from this. And well, anyway, we've already gone through that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> So yeah, he leaps out of his hospital bed, and they all do the "Huh? What? Where are you going?" Yep. Um, but yeah, he's uh, yeah, he's got it. one more mission. He's got to uh, assemble the shards. He's got to reenact the uh, the siren. And that was the whole point of this entire quest. Oh right. But we get some we get some good. Uh, you know, a lot has happened since he was asleep, and so there's there's things that need to happen. Um, not from a narrative standpoint, but just because there are there are things that were brought up. Um, He's not going to give us the Blariana treatment. If you're if you're new to the to the podcast, Blariana was a character in the Mister. Um, she was mentioned throughout the course of the book as uh, a, a human trafficking victim, sixteen uh, year old girl that the romantic interest you know shared a van uh, to the country she was trafficked to. Mm-hmm. And we're reading the whole book. You know, she mentioned Blariana, this sweet sixteen year old girl. Um, and you get to the end of this terrible romantic novel, you're like, well, of course she's going to be rescued. Something's going to happen. No, Blariana is left in, in slavery throughout the rest of the book. But Ernest Klein's not going to treat his peripheral characters like Lohengrin, um, the low five, all that, like Blariana. He's, he's going to make them pay off uh, at the end of the book here. So we get this, this type of sentence. I also re- resurrected Lohengrin and the other members of the low five who had all been slain during their quest to retrieve the Dork Slayer. Yeah, their course. characters are, are well served by their by their narrator here. Uh and then so he's he's leapt out of bed to finish this quest. Mm-hmm. But the next paragraph, the next time Lo and her friends logged back in, they would discover that their slain avatars had been restored to life along with their inventories. <laughs> Phew. They Thank would God. They would also find their inboxes filled with offers to buy the film rights to their story. By the end of the week, there would be several quests for the Dork Slayer movie and TV projects in development. <laughs> what What is the time? What is happening? Yeah. The next time they do log in, they would find. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a mismatch. It's like, you know, when you start learning the different tenses in high school Spanish, you're just like making all sorts of errors like that, as you describe, uh, you know, Juan wanting to go to the biblioteca. Like, Juan would have wanted to be in the library at this point when he woke up that morning. Ah, oh, it's, but uh, he's in the middle of action. I don't understand what's... Well, he's sort of in the middle of action. He's he's yada, yada, yada over the... the, the characters that he built up to have what you'd assume was going to be a much more substantive role when you were talking about Lowe's uh, backstory and her uh, gender fluidity. You know, you were thinking that was going to pay off, but no, it's just like, no, no, no. She woke up. They got a TV movie deal out of it. Like all things are settled with them. <laughs> but so like, terribly done. I do want to ask though, because I have a, I have an opinion on the matter. Which, which member of the Low five was your favorite? Not Lohengrin. I mean, obviously she's, she's the best one, but who, who of the other four, Oh. Of, of these rich characters. I think it was the one who was super excited that they were going to get a house together and eat cereal. <laughs> I think that's my favorite one. That, that might have been Rizzo, because there was Rizzo. I think it was Rizzo, yeah. There was Castagir, Lilith, <laughs> who appeared to be going for a turn-of-the-century edgy emo look. And then there was Wukong, the half-man, half-monkey god. And I just oh. imagined, out of the several quests for the Dork Slayer movies and TV projects, there was probably like... You know, there's always like one that's like you could tell Wukong just like accepted the first offer, so he's got a really crappy like made for TV movie on like True TV, like one of those channels right. that you don't even yeah. know if you get it. Like it's you know a Pluto TV exclusive or something. Uh, right. That, they, right. They were going to get the rights to Wukong's part of the story. Right. The uh, the third tier in the Butafuco story sold yes, that exactly. one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, we, we, the Kleinians do not stop. They go, they, re- they resurrect Kira slash Lucosia. Um, oh, she yes. Op- <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Nice. She opened her eyes and looked down at herself in wonderment, placing both of her hands on her cheeks to feel her own face. Then she wrapped her arms around her body and hugged herself. The sensation appeared to make her laugh out loud. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why? Why? I mean, it, it, it's... It, she just so she laughed out loud, and you just you 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 looked at a cause and effect, and just hey, you, you never can tell. You don't want to say, uh, you know, there is no 
necessary. We can't prove cause and effect, but uh, I'm I'm going to go out and say that that's what made her laugh out loud. <laughs> oh, it is at his biggest moments. He just can't help it. We also get an AI uh, biting her lip. Yeah, yeah, that was she nice. She cast her eyes downward and bit her lower lip. <laughs> the AI did. Yeah, she. Uh, she. So yeah, the, the AI is capable of looking uh, like a coy uh, heroine in a Hallmark movie. And she says, I didn't really mind shuffling off my mortal coil since it meant I got to exchange it for this immortal one. So there's the, that's a different character talking about shuffling off the mortal coil. <laughs> and it's unrelated, right? And she didn't, she no... didn't mind. She didn't, she, what? <laughs> yeah. You, you didn't, you, so yeah, this is going to be the, the sort of tale of the last 20 pages or so is the, uh, characters are going to be brought back as AI versions of themselves with their complete uh, memories, feelings, their entire brain um, intact. And the the ethical issues are, as you would expect, dealt with in a... <laughs> not even going to pretend. They are hand-waved away. Every uh, AI copy sort of just seems fine like this. Like, there's no, like, what am I? There's no, um, I, I, I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. I was fine. You know, I had my moment. Um, every, everyone is just sort of like on board with it immediately. Oh, yes. I, I have a, uh, uh, I'll read his philosophical musings. So okay. This is skipping ahead, but then we can go back because sure. now this is the cat's out of the bag. Everyone knows what's happening. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if humanity survived long enough, the world might acclimate to this new paradigm. People in the future could be, would be comfortable coexisting alongside AI copies of their dead friends and relatives. Or maybe not. <laughs> I don't think uh, like Karl Popper or Soren Kierkegaard have anything to fear from the philosophical <laughs> musings of Ernest Klein. Right, yeah, any, any anyone who's uh, who makes grand pronouncements about the uh, you know why are we here? Well, you know why is there something rather than nothing? Um, I think they usually toss in or maybe not at the end of their uh, <laughs> <laughs> just to sort of have it both ways. Uh, so this is supposed to be a, um, I don't know, the the elf, the elf elven kingdom, right? Uh, Gimli getting three hairs from the elven queen mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, Take your word on that. Rest. It, it was from the uh, Peter Jackson film of the uh, J.R.R. Oh, Tolkien books called The, the Lord films. of the Rings. Got it. Yes. 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 Uh, resting in her open palm was a short metal bar about the size and length of a flashlight with a chrome ball at one end. Now, I don't mean to be a dick, but uh, <laughs> I just did a quick search at batteryjunction.com. Nice. I found a vast array of flashlight sizes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Pen lights, three-foot-long tactical lamps, yeah. military lamps. Yeah, of all the subjects you could have picked, like, I mean, a, you know, a bottle of beer, maybe, a um, soda bottle, um, yeah. a ruler. <laughs> yeah. Something of a standard size. Nope, he chooses flashlight. <laughs> and Battery Junction, you said. Batteryjunction.com, yes. There's a we long, are not, they are not a sponsor. Long-standing joke. I, I hope not, because we have a long-standing joke with our, our friend Adam, uh, who at some point in time uh, forwarded an email <laughs> that he was, he was receiving from batteries.com. Oh, sure. Uh, and it was just a, like, so you... You, you're still on this list? This hasn't been thanked something you ordered and immediately unsubscribe from the first time. <laughs> Batteries.com send you an email. You're opening them up and sc scrolling through them for details. So. <laughs> I'm glad there's multiple sites out there. Uh, yeah, Battery Junction, a deadly competitor of Batteries.com. <laughs> Clearly, they took the uh, flashlight uh, uh, market right away from Batteries.com. I have to imagine, yeah. When you, when you provide the uh, platonic ideal of a flashlight, this is, this is all you get. You don't need any other flashlight than this. Uh, more Klein, right in the middle of this, I, I guess, tender and magical moment. Mm -hmm. This is the culmination of everything we worked for in this book. In that moment... Her words sounded utterly terrifying to me. <laughs> well, what other moment did she speak the words? Like, we're in the moment, right? Right. Yeah. It's, it's again, it's that thing you, you pulled out example after example yeah. in that moment. But after it, the moment ended, I was back to being cool with it. Right. It's like, who, who, isn't there something, you know, some sort of dumb theory like that people talk about when they're stoned, which is like if you keep approaching... You know, moving your hand towards the wall, if you keep going halfway, 
you know, there's always a level where you can't actually get to the wall. Right. So like in that moment, you know, you're <laughs> you're right. you're still approaching the, the terror, but then you you move to the subatomic level and you're fine with it after that. Yeah, you you're only halfway there every, you know, halfway, so you can never get there. Yeah. <laughs> And now, so he's he's probably like you know he's hearing us sort of giving him giving him the raspberry about his uh, his lack of a sort of comprehension of the the deep issues he's talking about here. But he you know he's got he's got some some rebuttals in his pocket okay. because um, yeah if you you make a, a copy of someone without their knowledge, um, who are we to judge what she's going to think about it? And bam, the character turns out is a hundred percent cool with this, and she indicates it thusly. Uh, Lucosia turned around slowly, taking in the view. Then she looked down at her body. I don't feel like some sort of unnatural abomination, she said. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That's 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 good to hear. Um, you know, Dave's yeah, about to unplug Hal, you know, whose AI has gone rogue. But then Hal's like, oh, no, wait, I don't feel like an unholy uh, abomination that's going to wipe out humanity. Oh, cool. Then, then I'm good yeah. with it, too. It's on, it's on you, man. Yeah, I think that's what uh, Frankenstein's monster said when they they <laughs> met up in the mountains where the monster was like leaping around, you know, uh, jumping over mountains and everything. He came up and said, "Yeah, I don't, I don't feel like some unholy abomination." Yeah, and then Frankenstein's like, "Oh well, man, I was out, uh, I was out at uh, the bar last night until one thirty, so I am, I am definitely feeling like one today, man. Like, <laughs> weird that the shoes on the other foot today." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But seriously, if you don't mind, like, uh, I need a ginger ale or something, some Pedialyte. Make that happen. <laughs> um, uh, with Kira, I locked eyes with her. Nice. Yes. And then <laughs> it, it just keeps, I'm just going to throw these out because we're, we're almost there. We're getting there, folks. Yeah. Uh, suddenly, my heart was beating extremely fast. Nice. <laughs> Circle that, teacher. <laughs> Uh, when I, when I nodded, I saw a spark of what looked like hope flare in her eyes. Wow. Oh, it just keeps coming, man. He, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he just, <laughs> it, you know, it, it is, you know, you, 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 we want it both ways. Like it's hilarious that he, he just sort of hand wove around these, these characters, the low five and their quest, you know, for something like that. But then when he does try to describe things, he does such a poor job of it that you just, you know, it might be better just to say, yeah, and then that happened, you know, like in our motto. Yeah, then then they cured cancer and most other diseases. Because if you saw, you know, if you spent any more time on it, you just sort of, you know, it starts to shoot itself in the foot you know, within, within a matter of letters, not even words. Yeah, this is one, this encounter with her, because it goes on for a while. It's it's really, really dumb. But he, he kind of realizes that he, Oh, I probably need to solve another. If this is probably niggling some people, like, does she mind about being turned into it? Mm -hmm. uh, how are other people going to do this? What are we going to do with this thing? So it's paragraph after paragraph of that. It's all pretty boring stuff, and it doesn't really, it doesn't really solve anything at all. But he should have done the. Uh, I, I, then I woke up. I don't even know what happened. Yeah. He, he should have just punted this down. He should not have tried to drill down on it. Yeah, maybe he did originally, and then the, then the editor was like, "You did this four chapters ago in the Prince Battle. You cannot have him say I don't know what happened, and then cut to you know the, the, the scene having resolved itself. You get one of those cards per book, man." Um, I, I invite you all to drink in the writing of Ernest Klein here. Uh, then all of their jaws dropped open in unison. <laughs> What's wrong, guys? I asked. You look like you just saw a ghost. Two ghosts, H said. No, uh, make that three. Holy shit, what the hell happened? I told them all what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> then I showed them the rod of resurrection and told them what it could do. Oh. Drink that in, ladies and gentlemen. That <laughs> is how you write the end of the story. Jaws dropping collectively. Seeing ghosts and doing the blah, 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 what? Yes, yeah. What you the see, hell just happened? Talk about an expression. Yeah, you look like you've seen a ghost. Something that no one has ever actively said outside of a, a piece of Hollywood entertainment. Right. Uh, I also there was a you know, the whole point is like so. One of the ghosts you're talking about is Ogden, who they he wrestled with the uh, the implications of bringing him back for approximately a split second, but he did receive this reassuring. Um, uh, backup from uh lucosia when he's debating to whether to do it he says but anorak was a digital player character too wasn't he why would i want to risk creating any more like him she smiled 
You don't have to worry about that, she replied. <laughs> Anorak was a corrupted copy of James Halliday's mind, an unfortunate byproduct of his tortured psyche, an abysmal self-esteem. If James hadn't tampered with Anorak's memory and his autonomy, he never would have become unstable. <laughs> James oh, learned from his mistake. So she's essentially saying, this has been done once. I guess I'm the second one. The first track record of the one time it's happened went very poorly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nearly killed millions of people. But don't but worry about don't it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's essentially like the, uh, I think there's a, there, there's a, there's, this alarm's triggering something. It's probably a bird, like, right. launch the missile. Um, it's we, you know, we wildly worked irresponsible. The box out. Yeah. yeah. So he tells Artemis that <laughs> he has the Rod of Resurrection, which, as we're told, is uh, it allows you to create digital copies of real human beings as anonymous DPCs. I don't know what that means. Inside the Oasis. It didn't matter if they were alive or not. He just, as long as you've scanned their brain once, you can bring them in there. And it says, my mind reeled at the implications. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's, that's the, uh, the great moral question is, is hand waved away with that one sentence. So he, but he invented the headsets, right? Uh, I forget where it's explained where he didn't know that when, as soon as you put one on. <laughs> <laughs> it scanned. It basically it stole your soul it and sucked it up into the cloud. <laughs> yeah. yes. Ogden, I think, was like, he did the, they had that split, I think. Halliday did this, and Og was like, you've gone too far. So he had never put one on until right now. Oh, okay. So he always knew that it sucked, that it copied your wife. Uh, I guess maybe he was just suspicious. I'm not sure. Um, okay. I, I mean, Artemis never put one on either until right now, I guess. Right. Um. Anyway, Uh. so... They have, he brings Og back, you know, and Og, <laughs> they copied Kira, you know, when she was, you know, I think like 22 and, and on hot here when Halliday was listing after her. Then they copied Og, uh, you know, 10 minutes ago, um, gut shot and uh, 75 years old, like, you know, shuffling around Rivendell in his bathrobe. But now they mm -hmm. just, those two are just hit it right off. <laughs> right. <laughs> Their characters start making out as well. Um so even though Og has, you know, lived 50 more years past this digital copy, um, she never saw, you know, what their life was like. You know, they, they're still just fine to uh, to be uh, like, like they just never, they're picking up right where they left off. Well, I mean, maybe, uh, uh, maybe digital copies aren't as uh, body conscious as you are, you know? <laughs> With the brain too. I mean, it's like, you know, th their whole relationship would be doomed by Og being like, Remember that time we went to Cabo? And she's like, no, that happened when we were 27. Like, I, I, that was five years from where my brain ended. He's like, oh, right, right. You know, remember your, you know, your, your cousin Sue's wedding? No. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, the Love Guru is a great movie, isn't it? No. That's... <laughs> he's, he's past us. We're all done with him. Right. Uh, but this, let's talk about hand waving. Uh, it was clear to all of us that the world wasn't quite ready to accept digitized human beings as people. This is one thing he goes back and forth with this crap. Like, we've uploaded everyone, but no one's ready. They might not ever be, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just waffling back and forth. He can't mm -hmm. decide. Not yet, and maybe not ever. The Anorak incident, as it would come to be known, had further sowed the seeds of distrust against artificial intelligence. <laughs> so... <laughs> So are people like what is the point? But he's but so they're distrustful of it because of the Anorak in incident, mm -hmm. and I wonder was that like CNN or who did that? You right. know, with the the big bold font or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anorak Gate. Yeah, you know? the Wikipedia edit war over yeah Anorak Gate, Anorak incidents, like whether you capitalize I in incident type of thing. <laughs> right, but. Uh, but despite that, despite them all being distrustful because of the Anorak incident, <laughs> we're just going to, against their will, upload all of their souls <laughs> onto a, a, onto a uh, solid-state hard drive. Yeah, I mean, it just says uh, the, this, is the, this is the wrestling that he has right here. Um, and it's, it's the sort of thing that's like, you know, in complete caveat, in completely different hands, if this was completely different. Possibly an interesting book because it says humanity had just become the recipient of another strange and wonderful and unexpected gift, one that would change the very nature of our existence even more than the Oasis or the O and I ever had. I was going to live forever. We all were. We might be part of the last generation ever to know the sting of human mortality. From this moment forth, death would have had no more dominion. We were witnessing the dawn of the post human era. 
So wow. like, if, imagine if that had been, you know, page three, <laughs> yes. as opposed to three pages left. Like, you know, that's, that's, that's a big idea of the book. Like do that. And, uh, you know, don't compare it to general Zod and maybe you have something that's worth, uh, <laughs> worth a damn here. Well, you know, so one of the futurists, like, what is it, Kurz, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil, you know, mm-hmm. the guy who keyboards and electronic inventions, and then he writes books, and futurist, you know. Okay. Uh, his problem is he never referred to any of his big ideas as what Van Hagar referred to as the best <laughs> of both worlds. That was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was his big mistake. <laughs> Right, um, as you're as as you're like you know pr- predicting what uh, what the world might look like in a thousand years, you you forgot the uh, the hair metal band analogies. Yes, but that that was as we talked about the the past few pages as they're you know as characters are dying, being reborn, human paradigm is shifting. You're entering a post mortal era. Era you've stopped referring to um, you know Thundercats references. So when this one lands with a thud, <laughs> it is all the more jarring jarring of a record scratch moment. Um, to imagine the uh, yeah the, the Sammy Hagar era. Well, we weren't far off from uh, Gandalf and Yoda and all of that stuff. So yeah, you know, I suppose he's, he's keeping it real here. But do you remember um, when he said the Anorak incident as it came to be known? That was a that was like a major thing in his first two books. Oh like, uh, yes, I went yeah. back and looked at it. Our episode thirteen is called "Or as it came to be known," episode thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> Because he kept right, doing yeah. that. He would say something. He would be like, you know, the incident with the Starfighters, or as it came to be known, the Starfighter incident. <laughs> yes. Oh, look, people are talking about that, but they're also watching the movies of the week based on the Dork Slayer. So, uh, yeah, they're going a lot going the, uh, on. They're going through the various POVs of Anorak's Acolytes now. Uh, honey, I think they uploaded our uh, intelligence and our, well, basically our souls against our will. Hey, c- honey, stop looking at that and come over here. Yeah. The, the Dork Slayer uh, adventures are on. No, this is this, this is hilarious. It's so bad, it's good. They got uh, they got the guy from uh, the situation from Jersey Shore. He's playing Wukong. This is hilarious. Like, <laughs> they, I mean, did Travolta not call them back? Like, what, how bad is this? James Vanderbeek makes an appearance as himself. It's awesome. <laughs> Guess what? Uh, he's not like a, a, a good and noble version of himself. He plays himself like he's kind of a dick, uh, yeah. sort of an, a heightened reality of, uh, of what his character would be like. It's hilarious. Uh, but the, here, this is a good, as you said, the futurist who is, who is wrestling with these, these type of um, issues. Uh, eventually, if humanity survived long enough, the world might acclimate to this new paradigm. Did we already talk about this? People in the future. Yeah, is it, okay. yeah. yeah this is ends with, uh, yes. Or yeah. maybe not, or, yes. Or maybe not. Yeah, I skipped ahead to that. <laughs> yeah, <Sorry>. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just, uh, you know, that's uh, when uh, Truman was dropping the atomic bomb. This will end the war. Or maybe not. I don't or maybe know. not. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, all right. That's all I have for that. Yeah, he says, luckily, I already had such a fully formed plan. And I just like, oh, you've been a steady steadfast guide throughout all this you always seem very certain of what you're seeing um whether or not people are are smiling or laughing because of how they hug themselves so i am i am prepared for you to be our guide into this bold new paradigm well let's dive into it in a in a chapter uh, we used to make fun of all the old like kind of bad black and white um creature movies would would have the end and then a beat, and then the question mark would come <laughs> yes. up. Well, now we have continue mm-hmm. question mark as yeah. the final chapter of this book. <laughs> and uh, boy, does it it's talk about the culmination of all those big ideas. Here is the Klein mind wrestling with them and putting putting them all tying it up with a neat bow. I think. Yeah, he's uh, sticks the landing from the 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 ten eighty. He's in the air. He's spun around three times. You know, but can he can he get back on the board and? And successfully do it, and uh, <laughs> I think you will see that we don't. We're not going to pretend that, of course, he did it. He he does not. But he, <laughs> it's a. Uh, I guess you tip your hat for him for trying this type of thing. He, just like the earlier things where he, you know, we call them the turn to camera moments. You know, it's not it's not so much the messaging as it is the other idiot who's trying to shift gears into this. <laughs> you know, it's just the you've shown us what you're. Um, you're capable of. It's like the the frog on the back of the scorpion. It's like, why? <laughs> this yes. is who I am, man. This is my nature. Like, and and though I try to to do these things, it is just severely undermined by the fact that I am not very bright and not a good writer. 
Yeah, it's the it's the bad cliche of, uh, you know, hold my beer and watch this. Like, oh, please don't try this. <laughs> please don't try. It is not going to end well. Yeah, you, you see him, him him rolling out words like paradigm and you're like, oh, dear, no. Like, <laughs> no. why does he have a can of gasoline and a, and a, and a match? This isn't going to go well. <laughs> no. Oh, he's climbing up on the roof with the <laughs> gasoline and it's in a bucket. Oh, God, no. Right. It is. It's like him doing some backyard wrestling or something. It's like, well, this is clearly going to be end up as a as a fail video man like in the best case scenario so all that said hmm. the the tense of the book changes yes quite jarring because he really only has one style of writing so again this attempt is it is bold departure <laughs> the uh the continue chapter hmm. begins with all wade had to do was have the engineers at gss reconnect the oasis data uplink on board the vonnegut hmm Oh my God! What has happened? Yes. <laughs> it's like uh, you know you're you're seeing a a friend um, who is you know just showing up at the party and he is he has gotten a new haircut that he cannot pull off, <laughs> and you see him right. across the room and you're like, oh dear, like what am I going to say when I have to talk to him? I'm going to have to acknowledge this, like, but like, oh, I can't say it looks good. <laughs> What's going to happen? I I got I I got to fake up that I've had a heart attack. That's the only way out of this situation. <laughs> yeah. It's the uh, looks like you're having a lot of fun up there. Uh-huh. A moment of oh boy, I'm gonna have to grab onto something. <laughs> He's gonna tell that I'm lying. Yeah, this is very poorly handled. Uh, the second paragraph: Wade no longer wanted to leave Earth. So, did you have any theories at this point? Like, what was what was the point of view? What was happening? No, I think you know because we did we did a fanfic on the Patreon that I believe was from this perspective. So I. I, I I think based on that, I was like, I'm pretty sure they've, you know, they've all uploaded their consciousness type of thing. So I was not okay. super confused. I was just sort of like rolling my eyes. So you knew it was from, I just didn't know from which perspective it was. Okay. I, I was like, is this the, you know, the compute, the Oasis itself has come alive. You know, I don't would, know. It would have been interesting, you know, would have been yeah, a, <laughs> right. a nice twist or something, but no. Yeah. But no, we get this. This made me laugh out loud. Since they didn't want to send Og, Kira, and Evelyn off into space on their own, Wade and Samantha decided to send along copies of themselves, too, to keep them company. Yes, you read that right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, again, Dickens missed a chance to <laughs> uh-huh. to write something. Uh, I guess that's supposed to be surprising. I, I didn't find it surprising. Yeah. But. So we beat on, born back into the past. Yeah, you read that right. We were beating on. <laughs> yeah. uh, stately, plump, Buck Mulligan. Yep, you read that right. <laughs> well, maybe it's in the the, uh, the AI. Maybe it's being like, yeah, this this guy Wade. He appeared to be confused about a lot of the shit he was seeing in the real world. He was not certain whether people were laughing for this reason or that reason. So, but I'm telling you this, like you you this is uh, there's going to be no more dicking around with that. Like I'm going to tell oh, it straight. Yeah. And you, you're going right. to read it right. <laughs> so finally, got a reliable narrator here. A little so, too late, but. <laughs> So yeah, they've uh, they've all uploaded themselves, and he keeps talking. He says, with Samantha's help, Wade also convinced H, Indira, Shoto, and Kiki to send copies of themselves along on this great adventure too. And so, <laughs> so yep, you've read that right. Shoto and Kiki, <laughs> who have been you know awaiting the birth of their child, you know it's probably coming in a in a matter of weeks. They've decided to upload themselves before that's happened. So they're they're going to blast off to Proxima Centauri, never knowing this child. Just always being on the verge of, you know, um, Kiki, I, to to claim that this is something that would ever happen is is beyond the realm. To to how it would affect her psyche uh, to go up into space, not knowing this this child that she had been carrying for the past eight months is is so just beyond the realm of what it's idiocy. Is it's the well, only way to put it? Well, I think they're just they're copies, so I assume they were at the store buying a diaper genie or whatever and then they got the they get a text from him like hey is it cool if i send copies of you and and your wife but not your kid up into <laughs> up into space on the uh, arcadia yeah you know text back like yeah sure bra whatever i'm at the store <laughs> I, I, I guess that's how it worked i don't yeah. know yeah because he I... said he convinced them so right that, yeah that, I, maybe... that means that they were reluctant at first but he you know then he said a bit emoji of himself that just said, "Come on, <laughs> and yeah. 
And yeah, Oshoto sent one back to just like, you know, go for it with a thumbs up. Yes. Or, or he held out a, a screen in the uh, Oasis and then they took it and moved it closer to themselves and enlarged the font so that they could read it. <laughs> and then they were convinced by that email. Who knows? <laughs> right. Um, but this is a good, very just sort of um, understating the effect of, of everything he's doing here. It says they've uploaded themselves, the high five, uh, what was it, Artemis's grandmother. And since there was still plenty of digital storage space left aboard the Vonnegut's computer, Wade went ahead and uploaded the entire ONI consciousness database to the Arcadia. <laughs> he went ahead and did that. Oh, that's so good. Billions like of digitized human souls. <laughs> so again, uh, Chekhov's extra storage space. We laughed about it at the beginning. We Who's did. laughing now? I, uh, me? I mean, Since it's... there was digital storage space left. <laughs> How come he didn't, uh, he didn't upload every episode of Family Ties or something? That's Seems a like good... a lost opportunity. Well, that is, that is touched on later, though. I think, you know, the, if, if, if someone's soul is going to be, what, you know, a couple terabytes, I'm guessing, Family Ties is even in, like, you know, 4K uh, up transfer has still got to be just, like, 80 gigs, probably. Oh, yeah. But oh, I... man. And I wonder, is the up transfer still, is it, like, as slow as my, I have cable. Yeah. My download yeah. is very fast. My upload is still... Right. Man, it's yeah. just terrible. Well, that's I mean we got to move to Columbus. Oh, that's true. But yeah. just just yeah. the phrasing of that as if uh, you know, if if the mechanic had called you when he was, you know, changing a belt or something. It's like, "Yeah, I noticed a bit of rust uh when I was changing your oil. I went ahead and just scraped that off for you. No charge, of course. It's the uh, the same level of uh, <laughs> yes. thought he's given to uploading billions of digital billions souls." Of- human soul <laughs> and the reason was since there was space on the computer right that's the <laughs> <laughs> yeah we just finished packing up you know our house to to make a move and you know it was the sort of thing where it's like yeah we'll bring across this bookcase if we have room for it in the truck type of thing right. <laughs> that's the uh, the level uh-huh. of, of thought given more thought yeah, given. I'm gonna, Keep... I'm gonna chuck this box fan no, there's a, there's a little bit of room, so Connor went ahead and put it into the pot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, if I'm going to sell it, there's there's more people where I'm going, so that'll be a, a better market for it. So, <laughs> but speaking of a sort of a and by the way moment, um, it says billions of digitized. He's referring to that as this, not us. Billions of digitized human souls, which were were to be kept stored in suspended animation for safekeeping. Copies of Lohengrin and the other members of the Low Five were among them. <laughs> Clearly, it was, you know, the editor once again threatening to resign. Like, you introduced these characters. You went into her squalor and her her, her uh, torments. Like, you've got to mention them in the final page of this book. Right. Otherwise, it is the stupidest thing to have, to have made a whole big deal of them. And imagine if they were, if this was like a nonfiction book. And he describes how every soul in the world is uploaded to them. Oh, and I guess he was among them. Like, <laughs> the most passive aggressive way to describe. Like, yeah, we're we're all there. Oh, and they were there too. Right. Yes. Thanks, Dick. Right. Well, yeah, I mean it would be like, you know, if a uh, a major show like, you know, reached its its series arc, you know, six seasons of the Sopranos or of Lost and then it's like Oh, yeah, <laughs> that character we spent hours with. Yeah, they're here, too. Um, yes. they, their story wrapped up neatly, too. We didn't have time to show it to you, though. Tune into the movie of the week about the uh, monkey god. Right. Uh, so right after that, after we learn about all the souls that uh, he went ahead and uploaded because there was room, uh, we we realized that it's him talking. I mean, not that that was much in doubt. Well, mm-hmm. who knows? Yeah. I, I didn't really. Who cares? Uh, and I woke up inside. So now we know that's it's that moment. Speaking of the Vonnegut, I wondered whether he was reflecting the uh, Slaughterhouse Five moment. That was always a big thing, where the he's just telling the book in the third person, uh-huh. and then he says they somehow they get to Dresden or whatever, and then he says, and somebody you know the truck opened and someone uttered you know wow it looks like Oz or something, and he says Vonnegut writes. That was me. I was that man. And it's ah. like, oh, you know, jarring. And yeah, that's, yeah. I, I think since it's the Vonnegut, I'm wondering if that's <laughs> oh my just God. a pale. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's what he says. And that's where I've been. That's where I am right now. The, as I tell you my account of this story. Wow. The most yeah, traumatic moment of, of his life that's informed his work and, you know, influenced his worldview. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Revealing that. And then Ernest Klein just decides that's his, uh, that's his fun little gimmick for the final chapter. 
Well, we don't just get digital souls. We also, as you recall, several thousand frozen embryos. <laughs> so now, <laughs> deep, deep moral issues going on here, but uh, not for Klein. He's got it covered. Don't right. worry about it. Yeah, and they're they, but they, but I mean, please cut him, cut him some slack. He does. <laughs> they have these, these, they have discussions about this. They, they weigh in on these, on these. They wrestle with them. Uh, he says, uh, Wade and I debated whether or not it would be ethical to resurrect these AIs without first asking permissions from their counterparts back on Earth. And I was just like, I just, I would kill to see the unpublished pages of them having that ethical debate. Because <laughs> here, here's, here's, here's the debate. Uh, it wouldn't. <laughs> there, so there you go. There's the ethical debate. But I would love to hear, yeah, Wade being like, no, no, it'd be like, you know, in the episode of, uh, you know, head of the class where some, you know, that type of, that, that yeah, since that's the level he's working you, on. Haven't you rewatched the Star Wars prequels? <laughs> in the Boba Fett cartoon of the holiday special, I, I think there's a, <laughs> a scene that addresses this pretty well. Uh, but the conclusion of it is, but it seemed highly unlikely that this would even be possible if and when the time came to make that decision. All right, so why are you doing it at all? But anyway, ultimately, Wade left the choice up to me. <laughs> so just, uh, here, just dust the hands and walk away from that. That is done. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the way you would, you know, your 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 friend is like, you know, you're... you're busy doing something but you're meeting him for pizza later and it's like you know what do you want of the pizza just you take care of it like i don't need i'm i'm, I'm busy like loading my car up like i just please just order something that's that's wage issue with uh, whether he should resurrect the billions of people without asking their counterparts on earth uh billions of human souls also there's the frozen embry embryos like look look i told you i'm busy just yeah. handle it hanging up deal with it mother me <laughs> ask ask Shoto's uh you know eight month pregnant virtual wife um, maybe she could weigh in. <laughs> uh, we and we no longer need to eat, sleep, or get out of bed to take a leak. <clears throat> Which you know that aside, uh, eating and sleeping those things people famously hate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it also says our relationships with one another have also evolved now that we're immortal beings of pure intellect, freed from our physical forms and set adrift in the vastness of space, possibly for all eternity. <laughs> and I said, I do not think this is meant as a joke, just like the vomiting virtually retching. And it might be the dumbest thing that I've ever read after. So I'm sorry I copied your wife. Like just to, I'm going to read it one more time. And our relationships with one another have also evolved. Now that we're immortal beings of pure intellect, freed from our physical forms and set adrift in the vastness of outer space, possibly for all eternity. Yeah, that might have an effect on just, you know, on, on, a, on a guy's perspective, um, <laughs> being an immortal being of pure intellect. <laughs> oh, w Wade and Samantha tie the knot, of course. Yeah, they do a viral Bollywood dance at the altar. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad that those uh, sort of mid, mid aughts uh, viral wedding dances make a comeback. In 2045. Well, it lasts beyond that for eternity because the video they sent us of the four of them dancing together in perfect synchrony, perfect synchrony, <laughs> is my absolute favorite. I rewatch it every day. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, the what does he call himself? A being floating in uh, a, a being perfect, of, uh, immortal yeah. being. Pure intellect, free from his physical form, set adrift to the vastness of space, possibly for all eternity. Watches a synchronized <laughs> Bollywood wedding video every day. Yeah, but he so he doesn't sleep. He's time sort of ceases to have meaning. How is he marking the days at this point in time? Maybe it's by you know the the other people hear the Bollywood video playing from his phone or whatever, and they're like, oh, I guess it's been another trip around the sun. Yep. Three three p.m. I guess on Earth time. Who knows? Uh, uh, Shoto and Kiki are these kind of people, by the way. They sent us a new photo of their son every week. Oh, boy. <laughs> you, I assume you don't open that. Right, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, but you, you would also assume that would be like utter torment for the virtual Kiki, though. That's what I mean. I that, He just, they casually, but he talked them into doing it. So the other versions of themselves watch them having a, you know, a little girl. Yeah, but yeah, it would be like, you know, if there was two people who were, you know, two couples expecting a child and one of them, you know, had some sort of tragic thing where they lost the baby, like the other one, you know, sends them a picture every, every week. And I could really, should really rub that in. 
Right. <laughs> She's sitting up like, you know, oh, another weeping tangent. That must be a, <laughs> that's how we mark the weeks. Bollywood numbers of the days. And uh, when Kiki gets a new picture and starts sobbing and, and rending her virtual garment of pure intellect, that's, uh, that's right. a week. <laughs> um, but then uh, we, we learned that uh, uh, Wade... Uh, sends him a short email that he and Samantha are expecting a little girl. So a short email. You didn't have to enlarge it too much, I'm guessing, to see the font. They're planning to name her Kira. They both seem really happy, especially Wade. The prospect of becoming a father seems to have made him more hopeful and optimistic. He's going to be a great dad. It's like, I just, uh, I'm going to need more evidence because there's a mountain of it to to indicate the opposite here. Uh, Is he going to continue to uh, spy on people destroy their avatars um smear them ruin businesses uh be unconcerned with the effects of his oasis in fact he is the (laughs) oasis goes on nothing changes right yeah but you know he's he's you know can't wait to probably uh you know he's going to be one of those guys who like videotapes you know him on the couch with his 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 daughter watching Star Wars for the first time to get the reaction when she learns that Darth Vader is his dad or something. That's you know, <laughs> going to be uh, that's going to be his vid feed content. Uh, we get a little footnote that on Earth, of course, things aren't perfect. The people who remain back on Earth are still facing plenty of huge problems. <laughs> yeah, remember all those huge problems? The world was on the brink of collapse, as I recall. Yeah, there was starvation and riots, and uh, um, you know. I, I believe a, a a pandemic sort of caused a lot of it would, was casually mentioned, but hey, Bollywood dance numbers, <laughs> those are still going viral as hell. And here's my favorite thing. Again, the editor must have said, "You you, you know, remember this thing? You probably should you know put a button on this." Despite the Anorak incident, billions of people still use an ONI headset every day. What the hell is going on? Only a few dozen people died as a result of Anorak's actions. Nearly all of them. When he crashed Samantha's jet. <laughs> so just to remember now, um, you know, just this afterthought, people are still mourning these dozens of people while, while you were golf clapping one another's new avatars mm-hmm. and stuff. True, yes. This and was the backdrop of all of this. Right. Only a few dozen people died. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. That's, you know, that's the that's the body count on a lot of plane crashes, you know, uh, there's a few dozen people and you, you very, very rarely does that. Is that the lead on the news that night? Eh, a few dozen people died as this plane went down over the Atlantic. Uh, I think the guy, yeah, the guy who described that is going to be a great father. <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, despite all the uh, all those problems on Earth that they're dealing with, um, which probably include uh, since the. Uh, Armada crew didn't come through. Includes uh, cancer and most other diseases. They're still dealing with that. You don't. They don't get hand waved away in this book. But you, uh, the the storage space above the Arcadia um, has a sprawling Arcadia simulation backed up on a redundant array of solid state hard drives in the belly of the ship. Glad that got uh, clarified because I was concerned. I, I believe you know moving arm hard drives have a much shorter shelf life, so it's good to yes. notice. <laughs> uh, it's a digital library of humanity's greatest hits. All of our books and music and movies and games and art, we brought it all along with us. So they've got a digital copy of, of Roller Gator on there. Yeah. Bruce Willis's The Return of Bruno. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, certified public accountant in the case of the cremated 64 squares financial statements. <laughs> all Baby of it. Ghost. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> Baby. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's good to know. They've got... Uh, you know the episode of NYPD Blue where Dennis Fran shows his butt. Yep, um, they have a cop rock is on there. <laughs> right. But and then under a uh, like a you know a case like uh, Indiana Jones, like a pedestal with lights shining on it, Curly Sue. <laughs> you have to be a special level to uh, check that out of the library. That requires them to turn their keys at the same time to get to it. <laughs> yes. Did they get uh, you know the the clown who cried? Did they buy that from? Uh... Who famously oh, owns that? Dana Gould, maybe. Oh, does he own a copy of it? I, I feel like I feel like yes. I feel like I've heard that. I've I've heard that as a rumor, but yeah, I, that's. Uh, I wonder why it's not out then. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, did, did they get the uh, the the Martin Scurrilly Wu Tang album? The the one copy of that. Like, <laughs> these are the questions that need to be addressed here. Not uh, now that you're beings of pure energy or whatever. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm shocked that he didn't describe it or even make like a cheeky joke about, 
you know, one of his dumbass things that he likes, like, yes, I even brought along, the, you know, like a nodding thing of one of his stupid pop culture things. Uh-huh. He just says they brought it all. Yeah. He he, he, he doesn't call that. anything out. Like, why? This is the opportunity, my friend. This is when you can really flex <laughs> and show how much you know about pop culture. And yet all of pop culture gets a, we brought it all. Right. Yeah, even the inferior cut of Highlander or uh, Blade Runner where the narration is either there or not, whichever one these idiots think is the superior one. I've lost track. Yeah, he could muse on uh, Lucas's tinkering with the films or something like that, but no. Yeah. He could have gotten meta and been like, I brought that terrible movie Fanboys that was about uh, breaking into uh, <laughs> to, uh, the Lucas Ranch to watch, ready, to, uh, watch episode one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the coda, and that's, I think that's it. Um, I don't have any more notes, but uh, uh, he just uh, he, he he says this and I just uh, our existence is filled with joy and happiness. I am alive and I am with Samantha and our friends are all alive, too. And we are all together embarking on the greatest adventure in the history of our species. And best of all, we're going to live forever. <laughs> and I just like for people who have, you know, endlessly talked about the implications of. Um, you know, referenced movies and stuff. Living forever is the one thing that every work of fiction and and myth and and all that is universally against. It's never worked out for anybody, <laughs> and yet these <laughs> happy dumbasses are just uh, jollyly uh, embarking into space with the knowledge that they're living forever. And it, he's making it sound like a uh, a middle school graduation speech. Like, and all our friends are here too. We're all together embarking on the greatest adventure. Like. You know, we have taken the road less traveled, and it has made all the difference. As I look upon the sea of faces, I remember when we first set foot on the Arcadia. We were so young then. Yes. We were but acorns, and now we will grow into mighty oaks. <laughs> Webster's defines commitment not as an end, <laughs> but as a beginning. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's amazing that he took this on. But uh, I did wonder, though, because... This paragraph here is the solid state hard drives. They don't have an endless capacity. Those don't just last forever. Uh, uh, you know, I think this is one of those things that he's just. Uh, yeah, you, you mean endless like electrical pet capacity? They don't last forever. They they run out. They have machine cycles just like anything else. It's oh yeah, far, no. it's far longer, but it's not infinite. It's finite. It's quite finite. Yeah, there's no, I mean, he, you know, didn't even hand wave like, and now with the magical, you know, solid state drives that, you know, the uh, gregarious games had invented uh, that never died. Like, <laughs> doesn't even Yeah, I believe, to. isn't there the, the holy grail of it is some sort of crystal storage, you know, yeah. where you data gets stored in crystals that have no fluctuation. Huh. He didn't even speculate on that. Right. <laughs> Look, he used up his futurism. It's all, the, yeah. the bank is empty. <laughs> but we do get this line. I grew up playing video games. You, 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 we read 370 pages, and this is, this is the first time you mention this? This is absurd. <laughs> I, come on, I would have had a much greater understanding of this character if that had been told at some point in time during the book. <laughs> yeah. But then he says, and now I live my whole life inside of one. Yeah, just the, the lack of, of intellectual curiosity or even, you know, I guess he pretends to wrestle with it, but it is just, it is a... It is a man in over his head, uh, typing with one hand at 4.57 p.m. as he reaches for his uh, margarita with the other one. Uh, yeah, and I love that he does the, uh, so the thing that you read earlier, best of all, we're going to live forever. I will never have to lose them, and they'll never have to lose me. That's obviously the unend of a book, right? I mean, it's terrible, but it's an end. Sure. He just restarts that whole thing, basically. And the only thing you can do is to keep right on playing. Because that game is your life, and it isn't over yet. And there's no telling, class of 87, how far you might be able to get, what you might discover, or who you might meet when you get there. Oh, the places you'll go. Yes, always wear sunscreen, (laughs) as Kurt Vonnegut said. Wow. Wow. I mean. Oh, God. It's over. And like, yeah, like we said, this would this would have been, yeah, page seven, like the final page of the prologue or something, is these idiots, their consciousness going into space. Like, you know, that, that could have been an interesting, challenging book for the, uh, as a sequel, you know, the, the myth of the, the difficult second album, like rock critics would always say. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But no, he, he just crammed it into the final five pages, did the exact same thing for uh, 360 leading up to that and expected it, us to take it seriously as a as an intellectual exercise. <laughs> oh, uh, next book, maybe? The Adventures of the Arcadia? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it meets the the Paulines, like in, uh, in Moon People, and they have oh, uh, right. mashed potatoes yeah. and... <laughs> <laughs> It's oh pretty similar God. to that, right? That guy was, uh, I hope the Arcadia didn't launch on Halloween. That would have made everyone nervous. Everyone would be nervous. Yeah. Wow. I forgot about that. What a joy that one was. <laughs> it was. It really was. I mean, just when you see these people taking on similar themes and one of them re- being rewarded with millions of dollars, and then there's not that much to uh, really differentiate them and, and their bones. Yeah, but the how come other talentless people manage to be at least more entertaining with their uh, their blunders? <laughs> you know, moon people, I think we probably, I found that funnier, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like this guy entertains us to some degree because he does just keep, you know, stepping on the same rake over and over again. <laughs> but it's also, it, I think the, uh, the fact that it is so richly rewarded in our society, is, it, it's a, it gives it an undercurrent that it's hard to not be more irritated by. I think that's, you know. Without, if you handed it to me blind and, and made me guess whether this was uh, wildly popular, I would say, I guess there's a chance because he's making all these allusions to other popular stuff. But, it, you know, certainly wouldn't be <laughs> Steven Spielberg and number one New York Times book and all that. Because people, I, you know, humanity has higher standards than this, right? Ah, yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't ignore that. That is a big part of it is that he is driving around DeLoreans and, you know, has more money than God uh, Rich as Croesus. That's that's a tough nut to swallow when uh, when you read this prose. <laughs> but also the the lack of effort, as we've repeatedly, you know, from our you know just sort of two guys cracking jokes about a book effort. We're not literary critics, but there's just so many unforced errors, mistakes that are in print that they just didn't take. They didn't care enough too. Was another part of it. Is obviously so um, rushed and <laughs> and uh, and just just didn't care. Yeah. Well, there it is. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we don't obviously don't have any fanfic. No, no fanfic. Though we do have uh, an update on the the fanfic uh, statistics. Do you want to hear that? I would like to hear that. Yes. Okay, I got it right here. Um, this is from uh, yeah Lucas. He keeps the uh, the fanfic statistics. He says, sometimes when you cover a short book, I have very little data to work with. RP2 is fun because I have Connor and Mike's answers to analyze. Mike got 13 out of 24 questions right with a success rate of 54%. Very, <laughs> very close to your over new overall score of 57.58. So that's gone down just uh, 0.33 percentage points over this. So, um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I think you, you had a, a slightly below average season. Um, Connor fared better, scoring 15 out of 24 correct with a success rate of 62.5. This also brought his overall score down from 66 to 64.86. So we both had a slightly down year. Um, he says, I suspect that as Connor competes in more rounds of real or fanfic, his score will eventually plateau to its natural average. Well, how dare you? <laughs> oh, I, it will. It will. But he also Return said, to the mean. Sure. But he also said, you wondered whether anyone has scored a zero out of five in any rounds. Uh, not only is this the case, it was the first round of real or fanfic in 372 history, all the way back in episode three of Ready Player One. In September of 2017, Connor provided Mike with two passages. This was the round with the infamous fuck a duck line. I wouldn't count this as a true 0 for 5 ever since there were only two questions. Also, Connor informed you, Mike, that one was real and one was fake beforehand. So it was essentially 50-50. So yeah, oh, that okay. doesn't count for me um, okay, for yeah. 0 for 5. But uh, right. that that that's good. I mean, it's it's slightly above uh, blindfolded darts. So I mean, you take those odds in Vegas. That is true. Yeah, that just that little slice of uh, in your favor. Yeah, that yeah. that that's real dollars. That's, that's the money on edge. the table. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think we have to. We've spent too much time to do any more emails. We can maybe do a mailbag um, on Patreon. Yeah, let's do that. And we, so. uh, I mentioned it earlier, but we're we're talking about uh, trying to do some sort of watch of the. Ernest Klein penned movie fanboys. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Because I saw some, I saw some, someone post some of the uh, excerpts of that, and <laughs> it sounds. If you got real or fanfic, you would, you would, you would not believe this was a movie that got made based on some of the quotes I saw. From what year are we talking? Uh, to mid, mid aughts, I believe, like probably 2007. Oh, perfect. Because it's about 1999. It takes place when the uh, first Star Wars prequel came out. So this is. 
um, several several years later, they 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 are going to try to go break in so they can get a dying friend to watch uh, the the Phantom Menace. Okay, so probably you know pretty for the most part pre wokeness. You know his his recent. <laughs> so it should be uh, it should be interesting to see yeah. where he goes and what he does. Right, it's definitely probably around the same time he was doing Ready Player One, which had all the uh, all the the cringy moments um, that he is that he turned to the camera to renounce in this book. Sure. To no effect, to no effect, those passages, you know, just those passages, which were just as, you know, jarring and obvious as the, you know, the, those poor, dumb religious people in the first book, um, right. they had, there was, there was no point to them other than I'm sure him getting pressure from the, uh, you know, from, or, you know, you would assume another author might've grown as a person, but you have to assume with Ernest Klein, <laughs> you don't want to make no. any assumptions like that. No. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess we should rate it before we check out here in terms of where you put this book. Yeah, we got to find, do our final dumb sentence, too. A sentence begins with a capital letter. A capital letter is a letter that's big. A capital letter is not a small letter. A capital letter is big, big, big. A sentence ends with a period or an exclamation or a question. All right. What do you got? Oh, that the uh, the sentence song ended. It says it says it ends with a period or an exclamation mark or a question mark. This is one of the first ones we got from John H. You're a copy of Kiramaro's consciousness. I said, it wasn't a question. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> so uh, yeah, he might he might need some of that because we can we can tell if it's a question um, based on <laughs> what the sentence ends with. Uh, right. and that one was a comma. Uh, this one is from Chris. It says, when Og had moved out west. He'd apparently taken everything he owned with him. I, I'm, I'm in the middle of a move. I, I, can, I can assure you that that is, that is how it usually works. <laughs> right. You usually don't leave a bunch of stuff behind. <laughs> uh, this is from Hayden. Then I watched as her telebot suddenly turned around and began to run straight towards the front door of the house, which appeared to be made of solid oak. Just uh, again, when he tries to uh, when he tries to paint the rich tapestry with the little details like that, they just stand out even more because they're so glaring. Yes. Um, we have this one from Janelle, and then together we reached out with all four of our hands and pressed the seven shards together. And she just said, uh, "Ellipses aside, do, do they each have four hands?" It's just right. been worded very weirdly. <laughs> um, this one was submitted by Amanda and Harris. The O and I headsets hadn't actually harmed anyone, so humanity collectively decided that the Oasis neural interface was completely safe or at least worth the risk. <laughs> wow. The, humanity collectively decided that. The, <laughs> uh, they, you know, did, they, would, the, did the language barrier? I guess they have instant translating. Uh, so. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, Lucas submitted, Lucosia stared at me blankly as if she weren't sure how to react. He said... <laughs> It was at this point I gave up, not on reading the book. I just gave up in general. I stared at the ceiling and asked myself, why am I reading a book that feels the need to explain why a person is staring blankly? <laughs> um, Mike said, in addition to being immortal, I think this is the, uh, the, the consciousness at the end of the book. In addition to being immortal, I also have a photographic memory with total recall of every detail of every single moment I have ever experienced. And he said, from the character who spent two books recalling every detail of every single moment he had experienced of the most trivial crap you could imagine. The previous, you know, family ties. He's memorized all yes. that. Here we got, we got two, uh, two ones that I thought I, I tipped my hat to these listeners. This is from Colin. His dumb sentence of the week was, I'm also eternally grateful to my brilliant editor, Julian Pavia, for his patience, honesty, guidance, and friendship. <laughs> That's in the acknowledgments, obviously. Yes, I'm looking at it right now. Um, <laughs> Julian Pavia, the editor of this book. Say just his want, name. Just want that name out there. <laughs> uh, and then Jeff submitted, I also owe a long overdue thank you to one of my favorite writers, Jonathan Tropper, for letting me quote, people who live in glass houses should shut the fuck up in Ready Player One. And <laughs> Jonathan Tropper's just got to be like, no, no, come on. Yeah. yeah. Everyone thought that was you making that terrible, stupid twist on a on a cliche. Like, let them think that, man. Damn it. <laughs> it says uh, though it follows up with attribution at last. Ha. So I wonder, wonder if he just like the stab of his consciousness. Like, all right, I guess I have to acknowledge it. Yeah, or Jonathan was always, you know, he was giving him shit about that when he saw him. You quoted me in your book. You, you know. yes. it, it could be. A, it could have been a legal thing that he tried to uh, uh, pass off in the acknowledgments. Yeah. 
Let's see if I have any that weren't used. I mean, as I said, uh, I'm sorry I copied your wife um, was, a, was a true highlight for me. I'm sorry I copied your wife without her permission. I think um, mine would be, uh, yes, you read that right from, okay. from a book is probably my favorite. Yeah, that one is very versatile from, a, you know, said the robot pimp disdainfully. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I had a good one. This one was just, you know, it just in in the heat of the moment, uh, an emotional beat, but as, as clumsy as, as you could get. I heard Samantha scream over the calm as her telebot rushed to Og's side. <laughs> so again, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will point out as my final uh, quote from the book, right after he gives attribution to Jonathan Tropper, he says, if you enjoy great writing, please do yourself a favor and check out his work. Mm. Well, a- anyone reading this book does not enjoy great writing <laughs> if you've gotten this far into the book. Right. Yes. <laughs> if you're not doing a podcast on how terrible the book is, you're not reading this book. Right. The guy hands you your uh, your bag of Burger King. Hey, if you like great fruit, also check out the French Laundry. <laughs> not why I'm here, sir. I think yeah. uh, unless you're meaning to be insulting at this point in time. Yeah. All, All right. right. Well, yeah. Let, what's the uh, where? Where does it fit in the oeuvre? Uh, I'm looking at the list of them now. Oh boy, it's it's tough. Uh, where's the? Li- I should have put the list together. I don't have it. Oh man. Well, I can I can I'll give you the rundown, and you can maybe just tell me sort of like what what part of the 15 books we've read for this podcast. Yeah, you fits man. It on. Ready Player okay. One, Armada, mm-hmm. Eye of Argon, Tech War, The Forensic Certified Public Accountant, in 64 Squares, Bob Honey, Who Just Do Stuff, The Mister, Trucking Through Time. A Lair of the White Worm, Shadow Moon, uh, Moon People, uh, Digital Fortress, My Immortal, <laughs> Midnight Sun, the Twilight book, and Ready Player Two. Okay. Uh, well, I put it very strongly near the bottom. I think it's got to be uh, uh, with the Klukas and, mm-hmm. and Pappy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's just so dumb. Yeah. So relentlessly stupid. The tier of contempt, like the, uh, the, that, that level. Yeah. I put it even below, um, the Stephanie Meyer, which I really did not. That like one at all. Yeah. And that one, you know, that one, that, that's just hard. Cause it's the, uh, you know, the, do you want the, <laughs> the fact that it's a smaller plate of, of, of garbage makes it that more, uh. That rises above it, in my opinion. I think. Yeah, half yeah. the word count makes it. But you know, if if Stephanie Meyer had, her, if her editor, if her Julian had reined it in a bit, I think it probably would have been less offensive than this. For me, it definitely below Ready Player One and Armada, just because it was you know the same bag of tricks, but with the diminishing returns. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, where where do you ultimately rate it then? Uh, I think I would still put it above um, Shadow Moon. I think I would put it above Midnight Sun. I think I'd put uh, Sean Penn's God with a gun to my head. I don't know what I'd say. Ooh, that yeah, that's the telling one. That's the uh, that's the thermometer. That's the mercury in the thermometer. There is it above or below Pappy? I think I'd still put it above if you if you made me do that. I think the Pappy has the the shortness going for it, the succinctness. But I think that uh, it was just so grim and and awful and and pretentious. Yeah, I'd probably have to do the same if I went back into my mindset. Right now, my feeling is, God, this is, I, I have utter contempt for this. But <laughs> um, but I, I had a, a decent amount of contempt, obviously, for yeah, yeah. We, book, so. the Yeah, yeah, the deck was stacked against him going in, but um, it, it certainly didn't, you know, it, it, it fell on its face right out of the gate and never recovered. Yeah. Um, but what here's my question. What, what would you say if, you know, if we were at like a... Um, Adam Savage's uh, sketch fest after party. You know, he always invites some some VIPs back there, um, and you're milling about. And someone's like, "Hey, you know, the the Rift Track show was really great tonight. Um, by the way, I, I have someone to introduce you to. This is my buddy Ernest Klein. <laughs> what would you What would you What would you say to him? Um, That's a know. good question. I you know, in in interpersonal things, I I would have no choice but to just be nice and say it's a right. pleasure to meet you. I I couldn't. I don't have that in me to uh, <laughs> to bring up the book or to uh, needle him in any. I wouldn't do that. Um, but I, I've thought about that because it's 
it's a possibility. Yeah, there's overlap there's, of you know of vague you know extended circles. What yeah. if that? What if Adam Savage was like, oh, by the way, I dosed everyone's drink with a sodium pentothal, so it's uh, you, it's truth serum. You've <laughs> got to say exactly what you. Yeah, then it would just be you are literally the worst living writer I think <laughs> on the face of the earth. Are you okay? You should check yourself into a hospital. Really get a thorough checkup yeah. because you are not right. Yeah. Don't you get tired of doing this? I guess I would say, like, don't you? I mean, what, what, what? You just, you know, does it? It still brings you joy to just sort of say it was like that episode of, of He Man, like um, I, when I was when I was driving through uh, my horse on the Tolkien planet. It was like <laughs> being in Return of the Jedi. Like, what do you? What? Right. I guess you'd also ask. You reference a few times, like you know, shuffle off this mortal coil. So you're you have a passing familiarity with. Not that you can. <laughs> You can learn that without uh, reading any Shakespeare. But what uh, are there any literary sources that inform your views? Are there any, what writers do you like? What prose do you look at and go, hmm, that is, that is good stuff. I can't wait to read that again and, and see what he says to that. Right. <laughs> um, and he would probably just say like, um, well, I'm taking my jet back to uh, Austin. Uh, how are you getting home? <laughs> Yeah, like uh, Tom Petty with the uh, replacements, right? The replacements are. Oh, he was. Uh, it's in that book about them that uh, you know they were on tour opening for him, and they're you know drunk and smeared with feces in the green room or whatever. Like y you play the same set every night, man. They said to Tom Petty, and Tom Petty said, "How much you making tonight?" <laughs> <laughs> Three hundred bucks. <laughs> I'm I'm netting seventy five thousand dollars for me alone, let alone my band. See you guys. <laughs> <laughs> damn it Klein. <laughs> so yeah he he wouldn't care what i have to say and that's fine yeah you know? absolutely yeah all right well thanks to everyone who uh who took the journey with us if you made it this far your uh your appetite for this is is insatiable and uh we we, we tip our hats to you for uh for for reading ready player two Indeed. And those people who didn't read a word of it, God bless you. That's fine, too. <laughs> yes, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't add to the uh, you didn't bump it to, uh, you know, number numbered one on the on the bestsellers list. Like Brandon Sanderson tips his hat to you for that as well. Right. Well, we'll talk soon about what we're going to do next, I assume. Uh, yeah, I'll get settled in the new place and uh, we'll uh, maybe we'll watch fanboys between that as a Patreon extra. Ooh, let's do it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Everybody. This is 372 pages. Michael J. Nelson. Connor Listoka here signing off. So long.